Bibliographical Note, Preface, and Author's Note of Trivia and More Trivia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Trivia and More Trivia by Logan Pearsall Smith. Bibliographical Note, Preface, and Author's Note. Bibliographical Note some of these pieces were privately printed at the chiswick press in nineteen o two others have appeared in the new statesman and the new republic and are here reprinted with the editor's permission preface you must beware of thinking too much about style said my kindly adviser or you will become like those fastidious people who polish and polish until there is nothing left then there really are such people i asked lost in the thought of how much i should like to meet them but the well-informed lady could give me no precise information about them i often hear of them in this tantalizing manner and perhaps one day i shall get to know them they sound delightful the author these pieces of moral prose have been written dear reader by a large carnivorous mammal belonging to that suborder of the animal kingdom which includes also the orangutan the tusked gorilla the baboon with his bright blue and scarlet bottom and the long-eared chimpanzee end of bibliographical note preface and author's note Trivia, Book One of Trivia and More Trivia by Logan Pearsall Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One. How blessed my lot in these sweet fields assigned, where peace and leisure soothe the tuneful mind. Scott of Amwell, Moral Ecologues, 1773. Happiness cricketers on village greens haymakers in the evening sunshine small boats that sail before the wind all these create in me the illusion of happiness as if a land of cloudless pleasure a piece of the old golden world were hidden not as poets have imagined in far seas or beyond inaccessible mountains but here close at hand if one could find it in some undiscovered valley certain grassy lanes seem to lead between the meadows thither the wild pigeons talk of it behind the woods Today, i woke this morning out of dreams into what we call reality into the daylight the furniture of my familiar bedroom in fact into the well-known often discussed but to my mind as yet unexplained universe then i who came out of eternity and seemed to be on my way thither got up and spent the day as i usually spend it i read i pottered i talked and took exercise and i sat punctually down to eat the cooked meals that appeared at stated intervals the afternoon post the village post office with its clock and letter-box its postmistress lost in tales of lovelorn dukes and coroneted woe and the sallow-faced grocer watching from his window opposite is the scene of a daily crisis in my life when every afternoon i walk there through the country lanes and ask that well-read young lady for my letters i always expect good news and checks and then of course there is the magical fortune which is coming and word of it may reach me any day what it is this strange felicity or whence it shall come i have no notion but i hurry down in the morning to find the news on the breakfast table open telegrams in delighted panic and say to myself here it is when at night i hear wheels approaching along the road so happy in the hope of happiness and not greatly concerned with any other interest or ambition i live on in my quiet ordered house and so i shall live perhaps until the end is it indeed merely the last great summons and revelation for which i am waiting i do not know the busy bees sitting for hours idle in the shade of an apple tree near the garden hives and under the aerial thoroughfares of those honey merchants sometimes when the noonday heat is loud with their minute industry or when they fall in crowds out of the late sun to their night-long labors i have sought instruction from the bees and tried to appropriate to myself the old industrious lesson and yet hang it all 
who by right should be the teachers and who the learners for those peevish over-toiled utilitarian insects was there no lesson to be derived from the spectacle of me gazing out at me with myriad eyes from their joyless factories might they not learn at last might i not finally teach them a wiser and more generous-hearted way to improve the shining hour the wheat the vicar whom i met once or twice in my walks about the fields told me that he was glad that i was taking an interest in farming only my feeling about wheat he said puzzled him now the feeling in regard to wheat which i had not been able to make clear to the vicar was simply one of amazement walking one day into a field that i had watched yellowing beyond the trees i found myself dazzled by the glow and great expanse of gold i bathed myself in the intense yellow under the intense blue sky how dim it made the oak trees and copses and all the rest of the english landscape seem i had not remembered the glory of the wheat nor imagined in my reading that in a country so far from the sun there could be anything so rich so prodigal so reckless as this opulence of ruddy gold bursting out from the cracked earth as from some fiery vein below i remembered how for thousands of years wheat had been the staple of wealth the hoarded wealth of famous cities and empires i thought of the processes of corn growing the white oxen ploughing the great barns the winnowing fans the mills with the splash of their wheels or arms slow turning in the wind of cornfields at harvest time with shocks and sheaves in the glow of sunset or under the sickle moon what beauty it brought into the northern landscape the antique passionate biblical beauty of the south the coming of fate when i seek out the sources of my thoughts i find they had their beginnings in fragile chance were born of little moments that shine for me curiously in the past slight the impulse that made me take this turning at the crossroads trivial and fortuitous the meeting and light as gossamer the thread that first knit me to my friend these are full of wonder more mysterious are the moments that must have brushed me with their wings and passed me by when fate beckoned and i did not see it when new life trembled for a second on the threshold but the word was not spoken the hand was not held out and the might have been shivered and vanished dim as uh, into the waste realms of non-existence so i never lose a sense of the whimsical and perilous charm of daily life with its meetings and words and accidents why to-day perhaps or next week i may hear a voice and packing up my gladstone bag follow it to the ends of the world my speech ladies and gentlemen i began the vicar was in the chair mrs la mountain and her daughters sat facing us and in the little schoolroom with its maps and large scripture prints its blackboard with the day's sum still visible on it were assembled the labourers of the village the old family coachman and his wife the one-eyed postman and the gardeners and boys from the hall having called from the newspapers a few phrases i had composed a speech which i delivered with a spirit and eloquence surprising even to myself and which was now enthusiastically received the vicar cried hear hear the vicar's wife pounded her umbrella with such emphasis and the villagers cheered so heartily that my heart was warmed i began to feel the meaning of my own words i beamed on the audience felt that they were all brothers all wished well to the republic and it seemed to me an occasion to express my real ideas and hopes for the commonwealth brushing therefore to one side and indeed quite forgetting my safe principles i began to refashion and new model the state most existing institutions were soon abolished and then on their ruins i proceeded to build up the bright walls and palaces of the city within me the city i had read of in plato with enthusiasm and i flatter myself with eloquence i described it all the warriors that race of golden youth bred from the state-ordered embraces of the brave and fair those philosophic guardians who being ever accustomed to the highest and most extensive views and thence contracting an habitual greatness 
possessed the truest fortitude looking down indeed with a kind of disregard on human life and death and then declaring that the pattern of this city was laid up in heaven i sat down amid the cheers of the uncomprehending little audience and afterward in my rides about the country when i saw on walls and the doors of barns among advertisements of sales or regulations about birds eggs or the movements of swine little weather-beaten old-looking notices on which it was stated that i would address the meeting i remembered how the walls and towers of the city i had built up in that little schoolroom had shone with no heavenly light in the eyes of the vicar's party stonehenge they sit there forever on the dim horizon of my mind that stonehenge circle of elderly disapproving faces faces of the uncles and schoolmasters and tutors who frowned on my youth in the bright center and sunlight i leap i caper i dance my dance but when i look up i see they are not deceived for nothing ever placates them nothing ever moves to a look of approval that ring of bleak and contemptuous faces the stars battling my way homeward one dark night against the wind and rain a sudden gust stronger than the others drove me back into the shelter of a tree but soon the western sky broke open the illumination of the stars poured down from behind the dispersing clouds i was astonished at their brightness to see how they filled the night with their soft lustre so i went my way accompanied by them arcturus followed me and becoming entangled in a leafy tree shone by glimpses and then emerged triumphant lord of the western sky moving along the road in the silence of my own footsteps my thoughts were among the constellations i was one of the princes of the starry universe in me also there was something that was not insignificant and mean and of no account sylvia doria beyond the blue hills within the riding distance there is a country of parks and beaches with views of the far-off sea i remember in one of my rides coming on the place which was the scene of the pretty old-fashioned story of sylvia doria through the gates with fine gate-posts on which heraldic beasts fierce and fastidious were upholding coroneted shields i could see at the end of the avenue the façade of the house with its stone pilasters and its balustrade on the steep roof more than one hundred years ago in that park with its italianized house and level gardens adorned with statues and garden temples there lived they say an old lord with his two handsome sons the old lord had never ceased mourning for his lady though she had died a good many years before there were no neighbors he visited and few strangers came inside the great park walls one day in spring however just when the apple trees had burst into blossom the gilded gates were thrown open and a london chariot with prancing horses drove up the avenue and in the chariot smiling and gay and indeed very beautiful in her dress of yellow silk and her great spanish hat with drooping feathers sat sylvia doria come on a visit to her cousin the old lord it was her father who had sent her that he might be more free some said to pursue his own wicked courses while others declared that he intended her to marry the old lord's eldest son in any case sylvia doria came like the spring like the sunlight into the lonely place even the old lord felt himself curiously happy when he heard her voice singing about the house as for henry and francis it was heaven for them just to walk by her side down the garden alleys and sylvia doria though hitherto she had been but cold toward the london gallants who had courted her found little by little that her heart was not untouched but in spite of her father and her own girlish love of gold and rank it was not for henry that she cared not for the old lord but for francis the younger son did francis know of this they were secretly lovers the old scandal reported and the scandal it may be had reached her father's ears 
for one day a coach with foaming horses and the wicked face of an old man at its window galloped up the avenue and soon afterwards when the coach drove away sylvia doria was sitting by the old man's side sobbing bitterly and after she had gone a long time many of the old last century years went by without any change and then henry the eldest son was killed in hunting and the old lord dying a few years later the titles and the great house and all the land and gold came to francis the younger son but after his father's death he was but seldom there having as it seemed no love for the place and living for the most part abroad and alone for he never married and again many years went by the trees grew taller and darker about the house the yew hedges unclipped now hung their branches over the moss-grown paths ivy almost smothered the statues and the plaster fell away in great patches from the discoloured garden temples but at last one day a chariot drove up to the gates a footman pulled at the crazy bell telling the gatekeeper that his mistress wished to visit the park so the gates creaked open the chariot glittered up the avenue to the deserted place and a lady stepped out went into the garden and walked among its moss-grown paths and statues as the chariot drove out again tell your lord the lady said smiling to the lodge-keeper that sylvia doria came back Blyhouse. To the west, in riding past the walls of Bly, I remembered an incident in the well-known siege of that house during the Civil Wars, how among Waller's invading roundhead troops there happened to be a young scholar, a poet and lover of the muses, fighting for the cause, as he thought, of ancient freedom, who one day, when the siege was being more hotly urged, pressed forward and climbing a wall, suddenly found himself in a quiet old garden by the house and here for a time forgetting as it would seem the battle and heedless of the bullets that now and then blew past him like peevish wasps the young officer stayed gathering roses old-fashioned damask roses streaked with red and white which for the sake of a court beauty there besieged with her father he carried to the house falling however struck by a chance bullet or shot perhaps by one of his own party a few of the young officer's verses written in the stilted fashion of the time and almost unreadable now have been preserved the lady's portrait hangs in the white drawing-room at bligh a simpering faded figure with ringlets and drop pearls and a dress of amber-coloured silk in church for the pen said the vicar and in the sententious pause that followed i felt that i would offer any gifts of gold to avert or postpone the solemn inevitable hackneyed and yet as it seemed to me perfectly appalling statement that the pen is mightier than the sword parsons all the same i like parsons they think nobly of the universe and believe in souls and eternal happiness and some of them i am told believe in angels that there are angels who guide our footsteps and flit to and fro unseen on errands in the air about us the sound of a voice as the thoughtful baronet talked as his voice went on sounding in my ears all the light of desire and of the sun faded from the earth i saw the vast landscape of the world dim as in an eclipse its populations eating their bread with tears its rich men sitting listless in their palaces and aged kings crying vanity vanity all is vanity lugubriously from their thrones what happens yes said sir thomas speaking of a modern novel it certainly does seem strange but the novelist was right such things do happen but my dear sir i burst out in the rudest manner think what life is just think what really happens why people suddenly swell up and turn dark purple they hang themselves on meat hooks they are drowned in horse ponds are run over by butchers carts and are burnt alive and cooked like mutton chops a precaution the folio gave at length philosophical consolations for all the ills and misfortunes said by the author to be inseparable from human existence 
poverty shipwreck plague love deceptions and inundations against these antique disasters i armed my soul and i thought it as well to prepare myself against another inevitable ancient calamity called cornutation or by other less learned names how philosophy taught that after all it was but a pain founded on conceit a blow that hurt not the reply of the cynic philosopher to one who reproached him is it my fault or hers how nivisanus advises the sufferer to ask himself if he have not offended jeremy declares it impossible to prevent how few or none are safe and the inhabitants of some countries especially parts of africa consider it the usual and natural thing how caesar pompey augustus agamemnon menelaus marcus aurelius and many other great kings and princes had all worn actian's badge and how philip turned it to a jest pertinax the emperor made no reckoning of it erasmus declared it was best winked at there being no remedy but patience dies dolorum minuit time age must mend it and how according to the best authorities bars bolts oaken doors and towers of brass are all in vain she is a woman as the old pedant wrote to a fellow philosopher the great work sitting pen in hand alone in the stillness of the library with flies droning behind the sunny blinds i considered in my thoughts what should be the subject of my great work should i complain against the mutability of fortune and impugn fate and the constellations or should i reprehend the never satisfied heart of querulous man drawing elegant contrasts between the unsullied snow of mountains the serene shining of stars and our hot feverish lives and foolish repinings or should i confine myself to denouncing contemporary vices crying fie on the age with hamlet sternly unmasking its hypocrisies and riddling through and through its comfortable optimisms or with job should i question the universe and puzzle my sad brains about life the meaning of life on this apple-shaped planet my mission but when in modern books reviews and thoughtful magazines i read about the needs of the age its complex questions its dismays doubts and spiritual agonies i feel an impulse to go out and comfort it to still its cries and speak earnest words of consolation to it the birds but how can one toil at the great task with this hurry and tumult of birds just outside the open window I hear the thrush and the blackbird, that romantic lyre, then the delicate cadence, the wiry descending scale of the willow wren, or the black cap stave of mellow music. All these are familiar, but what is that unknown voice, that thrilling note? I hurry out. The voice flees, and I follow, and when I return and sit down again to my task, the yellow hammer trills his sleepy song in the noonday heat the drone of the greenfinch lulls me into dreamy meditations then suddenly from his tree trunks and forest recesses comes the green woodpecker and mocks at me an impudent voice full of liberty and laughter why should all the birds of the air conspire against me my concern is with the sad human species with lapsed and erroneous humanity not with that inconsiderate wandering feather-headed race high life although that immense country house was empty and for sale and i had got an order to view it i needed all my courage to walk through the lordly gates and up the avenue and then to ring the doorbell and when i was ushered in and the shutters were removed to let the daylight into those vast apartments i sneaked through them cursing the dishonest curiosity which had brought me into a place where i had no business but i was treated with such deference and so plainly regarded as a possible purchaser that i soon began to believe in the opulence imputed to me from all the novels describing the mysterious and glittering life of the great which i had read and i had read many there came to me the enchanting vision of my own existence in this palace i filled the vast spaces with the shine of jewels and stir of voices i saw a vision of ladies sweeping in their tiaras down the splendid stairs but my soul in her swell of pride soon outgrew these paltry limits 
oh no never could i box up and house and localize under that lowly roof the magnificence and ostentation of which i was capable then for one thing there was stabling for only forty horses and of course as i told them this would never do empty shells they lie like empty sea-shells on the shores of time the old world which the spirit of man once built for his habitation and then abandoned these little earth-centred heaven-encrusted universes of the greeks and hebrews seem quaint enough to us who have formed thought by thought from within the immense modern cosmos in which we live the great creation of granite planned in such immeasurable proportions and moved by so pitiless a mechanism that it sometimes appalls even its own creators the rush of the great rotating sun daunts us to think to the distance of the fixed stars cracks our brain but if the ephemeral being who has imagined these eternal spheres and spaces must dwell almost as an alien in their icy vastness yet what a splendor lights up for him and dazzles in those great halls anything less limitless would be now a prison and he even dares to think beyond their boundaries to surmise that he may one day outgrow this vast mausoleum and cast from him the material creation as an integument too narrow for his insolent mind dissatisfaction for one thing i hate spiders i dislike all kinds of insects their cold intelligence their empty stereotyped unremitted industry repel me and i am not altogether happy about the future of the human race when i think of the slow refrigeration of the earth the sun's waning and the ultimate inevitable collapse of the solar system i have grave misgivings and all the books i have read and forgotten the thought that my mind is really nothing but a sieve this too at times disheartens me a fancy more than once though i have pleased myself with the notion that somewhere there is good company which will like this little book these thoughts if i may call them so dipped up from that phantasmagoria or phosphorescence which by some unexplained process of combustion flickers over the large lump of soft gray matter in the bowl of my skull they their taste is exquisite they live in georgian houses in a world of ivory and precious china of old brickwork and stone pilasters in white drawing-rooms i see them or on blue bird-haunted lawns they talk pleasantly of me and their eyes watch me from the diminished ridiculous picture of myself which the glass of the world gives me i turn for comfort for happiness to my image in the kindly mirror of those eyes who are they where in what paradise or palace shall i ever find them i may walk all the streets ring all the door-bells of the world but i shall never find them yet nothing has value for me save in the crown of their approval for their coming which will never be i build and plant and for them alone i secretly write this little book which they will never read in the pulpit the vicar had certain literary tastes in his youth he had written an ode to the moon and he would speak of the difficulty he found in composing his sermons week after week now i felt that if i composed and preached sermons i should by no means confine myself to the vicar's threadbare subjects should preach the wrath of god and sound the last trump in the ears of my hell-doomed congregation cracking the heavens and dissolving the earth with the eclipses and thunders and earthquakes of the day of judgment then i might refresh them with high and incomprehensible doctrines beyond the reach of reason predestination election the coexistences and co-eternities of the incomprehensible triad and with what a holy vehemence would i exclaim and cry out against all forms of doctrinal error all the execrable hypotheses of the great heresiarchs then there would be many ancient and learned and out-of-the-way iniquities to denounce and splendid neglected virtues to inculcate apostolic poverty and virginity that precious jewel that fair garland so prized in heaven but so rare on earth 
for in the range of creeds and morals it is the highest peaks that shine for me with a certain splendor it is toward those radiant alps that if i were a clergyman i would lead my flock to pasture human ends i really was impressed as we paced up and down the avenue by the vicar's words and weighty weighed advice he spoke of the various professions mentioned contemporaries of his own who had achieved success how one had a seat in parliament would be given a seat in the cabinet when his party next came in another was a bishop with a seat in the house of lords a third was a barrister who was soon it was said to be raised to the bench but in spite of my good intentions my real wish to find before it is too late some career or other for myself and the question is getting serious i am far too much at the mercy of ludicrous images front seats episcopal judicial parliamentary benches were all the ends then i asked myself of serious middle-aged ambition only things to sit on lord arden if i were lord arden said the vicar i should shut up that great house it's too big what can a young unmarried man if i were lord arden said the vicar's wife and mrs la mountain's tone showed how much she disapproved of that young nobleman if i were lord arden i should live there and do my duty to my tenants and neighbours if i were lord arden i said but then it flashed vividly into my mind suppose i really were this opulent young lord i quite forgot to whom i was talking my memory was occupied with the names of people who had been famous for their enormous pleasures who had filled their palaces with guilty revels and built pyramids obelisks and half-acre tombs to soothe their pride my mind kindled at the thought of these audacities if i were lord arden i cried the starry heaven but what are they really what do they say they are the small young lady asked me we were looking up at the stars which were quivering that night in splendid hosts above the lawns and trees so i tried to explain some of the views that have been held about them how people first of all had thought them mere candles set in the sky to guide their own footsteps when the sun was gone till wise men sitting on the chaldean plains and watching them with aged eyes became impressed with the solemn view that those still and shining lights were the executioners of god's decrees and irresistible instruments of his wrath and that they moved fatally among their celestial houses to ordain and set out the fortunes and misfortunes of each race of newborn mortals and so it was believed that every man or woman had from the cradle fighting for or against him or her some great star formalhaut perhaps aldebaran altair while great heroes and princes were more splendidly attended and marched out to their forgotten battles with troops and armies of heavenly constellations but this noble old view was not believed in now the stars were no longer regarded as malignant or beneficent powers and i explained how most serious people thought that somewhere though just where they did not know above the vault of sky was to be found the final home of earnest men and women where as a reward for their right views and conduct they were to rejoice forever wearing those diamonds of the starry night arranged in glorious crowns this notion however had been disputed by poets and lovers it was love according to these young astronomers that moved the sun and other stars the constellations being heavenly palaces where people who had adored each other were to meet and live always together after death then i spoke of the modern and real immensity of the unfathomed skies but suddenly the vast meaning of my words rushed into my mind i felt myself dwindling falling through the blue and yet in these silent seconds there thrilled through me in the cool sweet air and night no chill of death or nothingness but the taste and joy of this earth this orchard plot of earth floating unknown far away in unfathomed space with its moon and meadows my map the known world i call the map which i amused myself making for the children's schoolroom it included france england italy greece and all the old shores of the mediterranean 
but the rest i mark unknown sketching into the east the doubtful realms of ninus and semiramis changing back germany into the hyrcanian forest and drawing pictures of the supposed inhabitants of these unexplored regions dog apes satyrs cannibals and misanthropes cimmerians involved in darkness amazons and headless men and all around the map i coiled the coils and curled the curling waves of the great sea oceanum with the bursting cheeks of the four winds blowing from the four imagined hinges of the universe the snob as i paced in fine company on that terrace i felt chosen exempt and curiously happy there was a glamour in the air a something in the special flavour of that moment that was like the consciousness of salvation or the smell of ripe peaches on a sunny wall i know what you're going to call me reader but i am not to be bullied and abashed by words and after all why not let oneself be dazzled and enchanted are not illusions pleasant and is this a world in which romance hangs on every tree and how about your own life is that then so full of golden visions companions dearest prettiest and sweetest of my retinue who gather with delicate industry bits of silk and down from the bleak world to make the soft nest of my fatuous repose whoever whisper honeyed words in my ear or trip before me holding up deceiving mirrors is it hope or is it not rather vanity that i love the best edification i must really improve my mind i tell myself and once more begin to patch and repair that crazy structure so i toil and toil on at the vain task of edification though the wind tears off the tiles the floors give way the ceilings fall strange birds build untidy nests in the rafters and owls hoot and laugh in the tumbling chimneys the rose the old lady had always been proud of the great rose tree in her garden and was fond of telling how it had grown from a cutting she had brought years before from italy when she was first married she and her husband had been travelling back in their carriage from rome it was before the time of railways and on a bad piece of road south of siena they had broken down and had been forced to pass the night in a little house by the roadside the accommodation was wretched of course she had spent a sleepless night and rising early had stood wrapped up at her window with the cool air blowing on her face to watch the dawn she could still after all these years remember the blue mountains with the bright moon above them and how a far-off town on one of the peaks had gradually grown whiter and whiter till the moon faded the mountains were touched with the pink of the rising sun and suddenly the town was lit as by an illumination one window after another catching and reflecting the sun's beams till at last the whole little city twinkled and sparkled up in the sky like a nest of stars that morning finding they would have to wait while their carriage was being repaired they had driven in a local conveyance up to the city on the mountain where they had been told they would find better quarters and there they had stayed two or three days it was one of the miniature italian cities with a high church a pretentious piazza a few narrow streets and little palaces perched all compact and complete on the top of a mountain within an enclosure of walls hardly larger than an english kitchen garden but it was full of life and noise echoing all day and all night with the sounds of feet and voices the cafe of the simple inn where they stayed was the meeting-place of the notabilities of the little city the sindaco the avocato the doctor and a few others and among them they noticed a beautiful slim talkative old man with bright black eyes and snow-white hair tall and straight and still with the figure of a youth although the waiter told them with pride that the comte was molto vecchio would in fact be eighty in the following year he was the last of his family the waiter added they had once been great and rich people but he had no descendants in fact the waiter mentioned with complacency as if it were a story on which the locality prided itself that the comte had been unfortunate in love and had never married the old gentleman however seemed cheerful enough and it was plain that he took an interest in the strangers and wished to make their acquaintance 
This was soon effected by the friendly waiter, and after a little talk the old man invited them to visit his villa and garden which were just outside the walls of the town. So the next afternoon, when the sun began to descend and they saw in glimpses through the doorways and windows blue shadows beginning to spread over the brown mountains, they went to pay their visit. It was not much of a place, a small modernized stucco villa with a hot pebbly garden and in it a stone basin with torpid goldfish and a statue of Diana and her hounds against the wall but what gave a glory to it was a gigantic rose-tree which clambered over the house almost smothering the windows and filling the air with the perfume of its sweetness yes it was a fine rose the count said proudly when they praised it and he would tell the signora about it and as they sat there drinking the wine he offered them he alluded with the cheerful indifference of old age to his love affair as though he took for granted that they had heard of it already the lady lived across the valley there beyond that hill i was a young man then for it was many years ago i used to ride over to see her it was a long way but i rode fast for young men as no doubt the signora knows are impatient but the lady was not kind she would keep me waiting oh for hours and one day when i had waited very long i grew very angry and as i walked up and down in the garden where she had told me she would see me i broke one of her roses broke a branch from it and when i saw what i had done i hid it inside my coat so and when i came home i planted it and the signora sees how it has grown if the signora admires it i must give her a cutting to plant also in her garden i am told the english have beautiful gardens that are green and not burnt with the sun like ours the next day when their mended carriage had come up to fetch them and they were just starting to drive away from the inn the comte's old servant appeared with the rose cutting neatly wrapped up and the compliments and wishes for a bon viaggio from her master the town collected to see them depart and the children ran after their carriage through the gate of the little city they heard a rush of feet behind them for a few moments but soon they were far down toward the valley the little town with all its noise and life was high above them on its mountain peak she had planted the rose at home where it had grown and flourished in a wonderful manner and every june the great mass of leaves and shoots still broke out into a passionate splendor of scent and scarlet color as if in its root and fibers there still burnt the anger and thwarted desire of that italian lover of course the old comte must have died many years ago she had forgotten his name and had even forgotten the name of the mountain city that she had stayed in after first seeing it twinkling at dawn in the sky like a nest of stars the vicar of lynch when i heard through the country gossip of the strange happening at lynch which had caused so great a scandal and led to the disappearance of the deaf old vicar of that remote village i collected all the reports i could about it for i felt that at the centre of this uncomprehending talk and wild anecdote there was something with more meaning than a mere sudden outbreak of blasphemy and madness it appeared that the old vicar after some years spent in the quiet discharge of his parochial duties had been noticed to become more and more odd in his appearance and behavior and it was also said that he had gradually introduced certain alterations into the church services these had been vaguely supposed at the time to be of a high church character but afterwards they were put down to a growing mental derangement which had finally culminated at that notorious harvest festival when his career as a clergyman of the church of england had ended on this painful occasion the old man had come into church outlandishly dressed and had gone through a service with chanted gibberish and unaccustomed gestures and prayers which were unfamiliar to his congregation there was also talk of a woman's figure on the altar which the vicar had unveiled at a solemn moment in this performance and i also heard echo of other gossip gossip that was however authoritatively contradicted and suppressed as much as possible about the use of certain other symbols of a most unsuitable kind then a few days after the old man had disappeared some of the neighbors believed that he was dead some that he was now shut up in an asylum for the insane 
such was the fantastic and almost incredible talk i listened to but in which as i say i found much more meaning than my neighbours for one thing although they knew that the vicar had come from oxford to this remote college living they knew nothing of his work and scholarly reputation in that university and none of them had probably ever heard of much less read an important book which he had written and which was the standard work on his special subject to them he was simply a deaf eccentric and solitary clergyman and i think i was the only person in the neighbourhood who had conversed with him on the subject concerning which he was the greatest living authority in england for i had seen the old man once curiously enough at the time of a harvest festival though it was some years before the one which led to his disappearance bicycling one day over the hills i had ridden down into a valley of cornfields and then passing along an unfenced road that ran across a wide expanse of stubble i came after getting off to open three or four gates upon a group of thatched cottages with a little unrestored norman church standing among great elms i left my bicycle and walked through the churchyard and as i went into the church through its deeply recessed norman doorway a surprisingly pretty sight met my eyes the dim cool little interior was set out and richly adorned with an abundance of fruit and vegetables yellow gourds apples and plums and golden wheat sheaves great loaves of bread and garlands of september flowers a shabby-looking old clergyman was standing on the top of a step-ladder finishing the decorations when i entered as soon as he saw me he came down and i spoke to him praising the decorations and raising my voice a little for i noticed that he was somewhat deaf we talked of the harvest festival and as i soon perceived that i was talking with a man of books and university education i ventured to hint at what had vividly impressed me in that old gaudily decorated church its pagan character as if it were a rude archaic temple in some corner of the antique world which had been adorned two thousand years ago by pious country folk for some local festival the old clergyman was not in the least shocked by my remark it seemed indeed rather to please him there was he agreed something of a pagan character in the modern harvest festival it was no doubt a bit of the old primitive vegetation ritual the old religion of the soil a festival which like so many others had not been destroyed by christianity but absorbed into it and given a new meaning indeed he added talking on as if the subject interested him and expressing himself with a certain donnish carefulness of speech that i found pleasant to listen to the harvest festival is undoubtedly a survival of the prehistoric worship of that corn goddess who in classical times was called demeter and iulo and ceres but whose cult as an earth mother and corn spirit is of much greater antiquity for there is no doubt that this vegetation spirit has been worshipped from the earliest times by agricultural peoples the wheat fields and ripe harvests being naturally suggestive of the presence amid the corn of a kindly being who in return for due rites and offerings will vouchsafe nourishing rains and golden harvests he mentioned the references in virgil and the description in theocritus of a sicilian harvest festival these were no doubt familiar to me but if i was interested in the subject i should find he said much more information collected in a book which he had written but of which i had probably never heard about the vegetation deities in greek religion as it happened i knew the book and felt now much interested in my chance meeting with the distinguished author and after expressing this as best i could i rode off promising to visit him again this promise i was never able to fulfil but when afterwards on my return to the neighbourhood i heard of that unhappy scandal my memory of this meeting and our talk enabled me to form a theory as to what had really happened it seemed plain to me that the change had been too violent for this elderly scholar taken from his books and college rooms and set down in the solitude of this remote valley amid the richness and living sap of nature the gay spectacle right under his old eyes of growing shoots and budding foliage of blossoming and flowering and the ripening of fruits and crops had little by little such was my theory unhinged his brains 
more and more his thoughts had come to dwell not on the doctrines of the church in which he had long ago taken orders but on the pagan rites which had formed his lifelong study and which had been the expression of a life not unlike the agricultural life amid which he now found himself living so as his derangement grew upon him in his solitude he had gradually transformed with a maniac's cunning the christian services and led his little congregation all unknown to themselves back toward their ancestral worship of the corn goddess at last he had thrown away all disguise and had appeared as a hierophant of demeter dressed in a fawn skin with a crown of poplar leaves and pedantically carrying the mystic basket and the winnowing fan appropriate to these mysteries the wheaten posset he offered the shocked communicants belonged to these also and the figure of a woman on the altar was of course the holy wheat sheaf whose unveiling was the culminating point in that famous ritual it is much to be regretted that i could not recover full and more exact details of that celebration in which this great scholar had probably embodied his mature knowledge concerning a subject which has puzzled generations of students but what powers of careful observation could one expect from a group of laborers and small farmers some of the things that reached my ears i refused to believe the mention of pig's blood for instance and especially the talk of certain grosser symbols which the choir-boys it was whispered had carried about the church in ceremonious procession village people have strange imaginations and to this event growing more and more monstrous as they talked it over they must themselves have added this grotesque detail however i have written to consult an oxford authority on this interesting point and he has been kind enough to explain at length that although at the haloa or winter festival of the corn goddess and also at the cloia or festival in early spring some symbolization of the reproductive powers of nature would be proper and appropriate it would have been quite out of place at the thelesia or autumn festival of thanksgiving i feel certain that a solecism of this nature the introduction into a particular rite of features not sanctioned by the text would have seemed a shocking thing even to the unhinged mind of one who had always been so careful a scholar tu quoque fontium just to sit in the sun to bask like an animal in its heat this is one of my country recreations and often I reflect what a thing, after all, it is to still be alive and sitting here, above all the buried people of the world, in the kind and famous sunshine. Beyond the orchard there is a place where the stream, hurrying out from under a bridge, makes for itself a quiet pool. A beech tree upholds its green light over the blue water, and there, when I have grown weary of the sun, the great glaring indiscriminating sun, I can shade myself and read my book, and listening to this water's pretty voices, I invent for it exquisite epithets, calling it silver clean, or moss margined, or nymph frequented, and idly promise to place it among the learned fountains and pools of the world, making of it a cool green thought for English exiles in the dust and glare of eastern deserts. THE SPIDER What shall I compare it to, this fantastic thing I call my mind? To a waste-paper basket? To a sieve choked with sediment? Or to a barrel full of floating froth and refuse? No, what it is really most like is a spider's web insecurely hung on leaves and twigs quivering in every wind and sprinkled with dewdrops and dead flies and at its centre pondering forever the problem of existence sits motionless the spider-like and uncanny soul end of trivia book one Trivia Book Two of Trivia and More Trivia by Logan Pearsall Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Thou Trivia, Goddess, aid my song. Through spacious streets conduct thy bard along. Gaze Trivia, or New Art of Walking Streets of London. L'Oiseau Bleu. What is it? I have more than once asked myself. What is it that I am looking for in my walks about London? 
Sometimes it seems to me as if I were following a bird, a bright bird that sings sweetly as it floats about from one place to another. When I find myself, however, among persons of middle age and settled principles, see them moving regularly to their offices, what keeps them going, I ask myself, and I feel ashamed of myself and my bird. There is, though, a philosophic doctrine. I studied it at college, and I know that many serious people believe it, which maintains that all men, in spite of appearances and pretensions, all live alike for pleasure. This theory certainly brings portly respected persons very near to me. Indeed, with a sense of low complicity, I have sometimes followed and watched a bishop. Was he, too, on the hunt for pleasure, solemnly pursuing his bird? at the bank. Entering the bank in a composed manner, I drew a check and handed it to the cashier through the grating. Then I eyed him narrowly. Would not that astute official see that I was only posing as a real person? No, he calmly opened a little drawer, took out some real sovereigns, counted them carefully, and handed them to me in a brass-tipped shovel. I went away feeling I had perpetrated a delightful fraud. I had got some of the gold of the actual world. Yet now and then, at the sight of my name on a visiting card, or of my face photographed in a group among other faces, or when I see a letter addressed in my hand, or catch the sound of my own voice, I grow shy in the presence of a mysterious person who is myself, is known by my name, and who apparently does exist. Can it be possible that I am as real as anyone else, and that all of us, the cashier and banker at the bank, the king on his throne, all feel ourselves like ghosts and goblins in the authentic world? Mammon Moralists and church fathers have named it the root of all evil, the begetter of hate and bloodshed, the sure cause of the soul's damnation. It has been called trash, muck, dunghill excrement by grave authors. The love of it is denounced in all sacred writings. We find it reprehended on Chaldean bricks and in the earliest papyri. Buddha, Confucius, Christ set their faces against it, and they have been followed in more modern times by beneficed clergymen, Sunday school teachers, and the leaders of the higher thought. But have the condemnations of all the ages done anything to tarnish that bright luster? Men dig for it ever deeper into the earth's intestines, travel in search of it farther and farther to arctic and unpleasant regions. In spite of all my moral reading, I must confess that I like to have some of this gaudy substance in my pocket. Its presence cheers and comforts me, diffuses a genial warmth through my body. My eyes rejoice in the shine of it, its clinkant sound is music to my ears. Since I, then, am in his paid service and reject none of the doles of his bounty, I, too, dwell in the house of Mammon. I bow before the idol and taste the unhallowed ecstasy. How many altars have been overthrown, and how many theologies and heavenly dreams have had their bottoms knocked out of them, while he has sat there, a great god, golden and adorned, and secure on his unmoved throne. I see the world. But you go nowhere, see nothing of the world, my cousin said. Now, though I do go sometimes to the parties to which I am now and then invited, I find, as a matter of fact, that I get really much more pleasure by looking in at windows and have a way of my own of seeing the world, and of summer evenings when the motors hurry through the late twilight and the great houses take on airs of inscrutable expectation, I go owling out through the dusk and wandering toward the west lose my way in unknown streets, an unknown city of revels. And when a door opens and a bediamonded lady moves to her motor over carpets unrolled by powdered footmen, I can easily think her some great courtesan or some half-believed duchess, hurrying to card-tables and lit candles and strange scenes of joy. I like to see that there are still splendid people on this flat earth, and at dances, standing in the street with the crowd and stirred by the music, the lights, the rushing sound of voices, I think the ladies as beautiful as stars who move up those lanes of light 
past our rows of vagabond faces the young men look like lords in novels and if as it has once or twice happened people i know go by me they strike me as changed and rapt beyond my sphere and when on hot nights windows are left open and i can look in at dinner parties as i peer through lace curtains and window flowers at the silver the women's shoulders the shimmer of their jewels and the divine attitudes of their heads as they lean and listen i imagine extraordinary intrigues and unheard-of wines and passions social success the servant gave me my coat and hat and in a glow of self-satisfaction i walked out into the night a delightful evening i reflected the nicest kind of people what i said about finance and french philosophy impressed them and how they laughed when i imitated a pig squealing but soon after god it's awful i muttered i wish i were dead apotheosis but oh those heavenly moments when i feel this trivial universe too small to contain my attributes when a sense of the divine ipsiety invades me when i know that my voice is the voice of truth and my umbrella god's umbrella the spring in london london seemed last winter like an underground city as if its low sky were the roof of a cave and its murky day a light such as one reads of in countries beneath the earth and yet the natural sunlight sometimes shone there white clouds voyaged in the blue sky the interminable multitudes of roofs were washed with silver by the moon or cloaked with a mantle of new-fallen snow and the coming of spring to london was to me not unlike the descent of the maiden goddess into death's kingdoms when pink almond blossoms blew about her in the gloom and those shadowy people were stirred with faint longings for meadows and the shepherd's life nor was there anything more virginal and fresh in wood or orchard than the shimmer of young foliage which in may dimmed with delicate green all the smoke-blackened london trees fashion plates i like loitering in the bookstalls looking in at the windows of print shops and romancing over the pictures i see of shepherdesses and old-fashioned beauties tall and slim and crowned with plumes in one period in another these ladies become as wide-winged as butterflies or float large balloon-like visions down summer streets and yet in all shapes they have always i tell myself created thrilling effects of beauty and waked in the breasts of modish young men ever the same charming emotion but then i have questioned this is the emotion always precisely the same is it true to say that the human heart remains quite unchanged beneath all the changing fashions of frills and ruffles in this elegant and cruel sentiment i rather fancy that colour and shape do make a difference i have a notion that about eighteen forty was the zenith the meridian hour the golden age of the passion those tight-waisted whiskered bows those crinolined beauties adored one another i believe with a leisure a refinement and dismay not quite attainable at other dates mental vice there are certain hackneyed thoughts that will force themselves on me i find my mind especially in hot weather infested and buzzed about by moral platitudes that shows i say to myself or how true it is or i really ought to have known the sight of a large clock sets me off into musings on the flight of time a steamer on the thames or lines of telegraph inevitably suggests the benefits of civilization man's triumph over nature the heroism of inventors the courage amid ridicule and poverty of stevenson and watt like faint rather unpleasant smells these thoughts lurk about railway stations i can hardly post a letter without marvelling at the excellence and accuracy of the postal system 
then the pride in the british constitution and british freedom which comes over me when i see even in the distance the towers of westminster palace that mother of parliaments it is not much comfort that this should be chastened as i walk down the embankment by the sight of cleopatra's needle and the thought that it will no doubt witness the fall of the british as it has that of other empires remaining to point its moral as old as egypt to antipodians musing on the dilapidated bridges i am sometimes afraid of finding that there is a moral for everything that the whole great frame of the universe has a key like a box has been contrived and set going by a well-meaning but humdrum eighteenth-century creator it would be a kind of hell surely a world in which everything could be at once explained shown to be obvious and useful I am sated with lesson and allegory, weary of monitory ants, industrious bees, and preaching animals. The benefits of civilization cloy me. I have seen enough shining of the didactic sun. So gazing up on hot summer nights at the London stars, I cool my thoughts with a vision of the giddy, infinite, meaningless waste of creation, the blazing suns, the planets and frozen moons, all crashing blindly forever across the void of space. THE ORGAN OF LIFE Almost always in London, in the congregated uproar of streets, or in the noise that drifts through walls and windows, you can hear the hackneyed melancholy of street music a music which sounds like the actual voice of the human heart singing the lost joys the regrets the loveless lives of the people who blacken the pavements or jolt along on the buses speak to me kindly the hand organ implores i'm all alone it screams amid the throng thy vows are all broken it laments in dingy courtyards and light is thy fame and of hot summer afternoons the cry for courage to remember or calmness to forget floats in with the smell of paint and asphalt faint and sad through open office windows humiliation my own view is i began but no one listened at the next pause i always say i remarked but again the loud talk went on someone told a story when the laughter had ended i often think but looking round the table I could catch no friendly or attentive eye. It was humiliating, but more humiliating the thought that Sophocles and Goethe would have always commanded attention, while the lack of it would not have troubled Spinoza or Abraham Lincoln. Green Ivory What a bore it is, waking up in the morning, always the same person. I wish I were unflinching and emphatic, and had big bushy eyebrows and a message for the age. I wish I were a deep thinker or a great ventriloquist. I would like to be refined and melancholy, the victim of a hopeless passion, to love in the old stilted way, with impossible adoration and despair under the pale-faced moon. I wish I could get up. I wish I were the world's greatest violinist. I wish I had lots of silver and first editions and green ivory. In the Park yes i said one afternoon in the park as i looked rather contemptuously at the people of fashion moving slow and well dressed in the sunshine but how about the others the courtiers and beauties and dandies of the past they wore fine costumes and glittered for their hour in the summer air what has become of them i somewhat rhetorically asked they were all dead now their day was over they were cold in their graves and I thought of those severe spirits who, in garrets far from the park and fashion, had scorned the fumes and tinsel of the noisy world. But, good heavens, these severe spirits were, it occurred to me, all, as a matter of fact, quite as dead as the others. THE CORRECT I am sometimes visited by a suspicion that everything isn't quite all right with the righteous, that the moral law speaks in muffled and dubious tones to those who listen most scrupulously for its dictates. I feel sure I have detected a look of doubt and misgiving in the eyes of its earnest upholders. But there is no such shadow or cloud in the faces in club windows, or in the eyes of drivers of foreign hands, or of fashionable young men walking down Piccadilly. 
for these live by a rule which has not been drawn down from far off and questionable skies and needs no sanction what they do is correct and that is all correctly dressed from head to foot they pass with correct speech and thoughts and gestures correctly across the roundness of the earth where do i come in when i read in the times about india and all its problems and populations when i look at the letters in large type of important personages and find myself face to face with the questions movements and great activities of the age where do i come in i ask myself uneasily then in the great times reflected world i find the corner where i play my humble but necessary part for i am one of the unpraised unrewarded millions without whom statistics would be a bankrupt science it is we who are born who marry who die in constant ratios who regularly lose so many umbrellas post just so many unaddressed letters every year and there are enthusiasts among us who without the least thought of their own convenience allow omnibuses to run over them or throw themselves month by month in fixed numbers from the london bridges microbes but how is one to keep free from those mental microbes that worm-eat people's brains those theories and diets and enthusiasms and infectious doctrines that we are always liable to catch from what seem the most innocuous contacts people go about laden with germs they breathe creeds and convictions on you whenever they open their mouths books and newspapers are simply creeping with them the monthly reviews seem to have room for nothing else wherewithal then shall a young man cleanse his way and how shall he keep his mind immune to theosophical speculations and novel schemes of salvation can he ever be sure that he won't be suddenly struck down by the fever of funeral or of spelling reform or take to his bed with a new sex theory but is this struggle for a healthy mind in a maggoty universe really after all worth it are there not soporific dreams and sweet deliriums more soothing than reason if transmigration can make clear the dark problem of evil if mrs mary baker eddy can free us from the dominion of death if the belief that bacon wrote shakespeare gives a peace that the world cannot give why pedantically reject such kindly solace why not be led with the others by still waters and be made to lie down in green pastures the quest we walk alone in the world the moralist at the end of his essay on ideal friendship writes somewhat sadly friends such as we desire are dreams and fables yet we never quite give up the hope of finding them but what awful things happen to us what snubs what set-downs we experience what shames and disillusions we can never really tell what these new unknown persons may do to us sometimes they seem nice and then begin to talk like gramophones sometimes they grab at us with moist hands or breathe hotly on our necks or make awful confidences or drench us from sentimental slop pails and too often among the thoughts in the loveliest heads we come on nests of woolly caterpillars and yet we brush our hats pull on our gloves and go out and ring doorbells the kaleidoscope i find in my mind in this miscellany of ideas and musings a curious collection of little landscapes and pictures shining and fading for no reason sometimes they are views in no way remarkable the corner of a road a heap of stones an old gate but there are many charming pictures too as i read between my eyes and book the moon sheds down on harvest fields her chill of silver i see autumnal avenues with the leaves falling or swept in heaps and storms blow among my thoughts with the rain beating forever on the fields then winter's upward glare of snow appears or the pink and delicate green of spring in the windy sunshine or cornfields and green waters and youths bathing in summer's golden heats and as i walk about certain places haunt me a cathedral rises above a dark blue foreign town the color of ivory in the sunset light now i find myself in a french garden full of lilacs and bees and shut-in sunshine with the mediterranean lounging and washing outside its walls 
now in a little college library with busts and the green reflected light of oxford lawns and again i hear the bells reminding me of the familiar oxford hours oxford street one late winter afternoon in oxford street amid the noise of vehicles and voices that filled that dusky thoroughfare as i was borne onward with the crowd past the great electric lighted shops a holy indifference filled my thoughts illusion had faded from me i was not touched by any desire for the goods displayed in those golden windows nor had i the smallest share in the appetites and fears of all those moving and anxious faces and as i listened with asiatic detachment to the london traffic its sound changed into something ancient and dissonant and sad into the turbid flow of that stream of craving which sweeps men onward through the meaningless cycles of existence blind and enslaved for ever but i had reached the farther shore the harbour of deliverance the holy city the great peace beyond all this turmoil and fret compassed me round om mani padme um i murmured the sacred syllables smiling with the pitying smile of the enlightened one on his heavenly lotus then in a shop window i saw a neatly fitted suitcase i liked that suitcase i desired to possess it immediately i was enveloped by the mists of illusion chained once more to the wheel of existence whirled onward along oxford street in that turbid stream of wrong belief and lust and sorrow and anger beauty among all the ugly mugs of the world we see now and then a face made after the divine pattern then a wonderful thing happens to us the bluebird sings the golden splendor shines and for a queer moment everything seems meaningless save our impulse to follow those fair forms to follow them to the clear paradise they promise plato assures us that these moments are not as we are apt to think them mere blurs and delusions of the senses but divine revelations that in a lovely face we see imaged as in a mirror the absolute beauty it is reality flashing on us in the cave where we dwell amid shadows and darkness therefore we should follow these fair forms and their shining footsteps will lead us upward to the highest heaven of wisdom the poets too keep chanting this great doctrine of beauty in grave notes to their golden strings its music floats up through the skies so sweet so strange that the very angels seem to lean from the stars to listen but o oh, plato o oh, shelley o oh, angels of heaven what scrapes you do get us into the power of words i thanked the club porter who helped me into my coat and stepped out lightly into the vastness and freshness of the night and as i walked along my eyes were dazzling with the glare i had left i still seemed to hear the sound of my speech and the applause and laughter and when i looked up at the stars the great stars that bore me company streaming over the dark houses as i moved i felt that i was the lord of life the mystery and disquieting meaninglessness of existence the existence of other people and of my own were solved for me now as for the earth hurrying beneath my feet how bright was its journey how shining the goal toward which it went swinging you might really say leaping through the sky i must tell the human race of this i heard my voice saw my prophetic gestures as i expounded the ultimate meaning of existence to the white rapt faces of humanity only to find the words that troubled me were there then no words to describe this vision divine intoxicating and then the word struck me the word people would use i stopped in the street my soul was silenced like a bell that snarls at a jarring touch i stood there a while and meditated on language its perfidious meanness the inadequacy the ignominy of our vocabulary and how moralists have spoiled our words by distilling into them as into little vials of poison all their hatred of human joy away with that police force of brutal words which bursts in on our best moments and arrests our finest feelings this music within me large like the song of the stars like a glory of angels singing no one has any right to say i am drunk i shouted self-analysis 
yes aren't they odd the thoughts that float through one's mind for no reason but why not be frank i suppose the best of us are shocked at times by the things we find ourselves thinking don't you agree i went on not noticing until it was too late that all other conversation had ceased and the whole dinner party was listening don't you agree that the oddest of all are the improper thoughts that come into one's heads the unspeakable words i mean and obscenities when i remember that remark i hasten to enlarge my mind with ampler considerations i think of space and the unimportance of its unmeasured vastness of our toy solar system i lose myself in speculations on the lapse of time reflecting how at the best our human life on this minute and perishing planet is as brief as a dream the voice of the world and what are you doing now the question of these school contemporaries of mine and their greeting the other day in piccadilly i remember how shabby i felt as i stood talking to them for a day or two that question haunted me and behind their well-bred voices i seemed to hear the voice of schoolmasters and tutors of the professional classes and indeed of all the world what as a plain matter of fact was i doing how did i spend my days the life days which i knew were numbered and which were described in sermons and on tombstones as so irrevocable so melancholy brief i decided to change my life i too would be somebody in my time and age my contemporaries should treat me as an important person i began thinking of my endeavors my studies by the midnight lamp my risings at dawn for stolen hours of self-improvement but alas the day the little day was enough just then it somehow seemed enough just to be alive in the spring with the young green of the trees the smell of smoke in the sunshine i loved the old shops and books the uproar darkening and brightening in the shabby daylight just a run of good-looking faces and i was always looking for faces would keep me amused and london was but a dim-lit stage on which i could play in fancy any part i liked i woke up in the morning like byron to find myself famous i was drawn like chatham to st paul's amid the cheers of the nation and sternly exclaimed with cromwell take away that bauble as i sauntered past the houses of parliament and anyhow and anyhow soon so soon in only seven million years or thereabouts the encyclopedia said this earth would grow cold all human activities end and the last wretched mortals freeze to death in the dim rays of the dying sun drawbacks i should be all right if it weren't for these sudden visitations of happiness these downpourings of heaven's blue little invasions of paradise or waftings to the happy islands or whatever you may call these disconcerting moments i should be like everybody else and as blameless a ratepayer as any one in our row talk once in a while when doors are closed and curtains drawn on a group of free spirits the miracle happens and good talk begins tis a sudden illumination the glow it may be of sanctified candles or more likely the blaze around a cauldron of gossip is there an ecstasy or any intoxication like it oh to talk to talk people into monsters to talk oneself out of one's clothes to talk god from his heaven and turn everything in the world into a bright tissue of phrases these pentecosts and outpourings of the spirit can only occur very rarely or the universe itself would be soon talked out of existence the church of england i have my anglican moments and as i sat there that sunday afternoon in the palladian interior of the london church and listened to the unexpressive voices chanting the correct service i felt a comfortable assurance that we were in no danger of being betrayed into any unseemly manifestations of religious fervour we had not gathered together at that performance to abase ourselves with furious hosannas before any dark creator of an untamed universe no deity of freaks and miracles and sinister hocus-pocus but to pay our duty to a highly respected anglican first cause undemonstrative gentlemanly and conscientious whom without loss of self-respect we could sincerely and decorously praise 
misgiving we were talking of people and a name familiar to us all was mentioned we paused and looked at one another then soon by means of anecdotes and clever touches that personality was reconstructed and seemed to appear before us large pink and lifelike and gave a comic sketch of itself with appropriate poses of course i said to myself this sort of thing never happens to me for the notion was quite unthinkable the notion i mean of my own dear image called up like this without my knowledge to turn my discreet way of life into a cake-walk sanctuaries she said how small the world is after all i thought of china of a holy mountain in the west of china full of legends and sacred trees and demon haunted caves it is always enveloped in mountain mists and in that white thick air i heard the faint sound of bells and the muffled footsteps of innumerable pilgrims and the reiterated mantra nam mo o mi to fo which they murmur as they climb its slopes high up among its temples and monasteries marched processions of monks with intoned services and many prostrations and lighted candles that glimmer through the fog there in their solemn shrines stood the statues of the arahats and there seated on his white elephant loomed immense and dim the image of amitabha the lord of the western heavens she said life is so complicated climbing inaccessible cliffs of rock and ice i shut myself within a tibetan monastery beyond the himalayan ramparts i join with choirs of monks intoning their deep sonorous dirges and unintelligible prayers i beat drums i clash cymbals and blow at dawn from the lamasery roofs conches and loud discordant trumpets and wandering through those vast and shadowy halls as i tend the butter lamps of the golden buddhas and watch the storms that blow across the barren mountains i taste an imaginary bliss and then pass on to other scenes and incarnations along the endless road that leads me to nirvana but i do wish you would tell me what you really think i fled to africa into the depths of the dark ashanti forest there in its gloomiest recesses where the soil is stained with the blood of the negroes he has eaten dwells the monstrous deity of human shape and red colour the great fetish god sasabonsum i like sasabonsum other gods are sometimes moved to pity and forgiveness but to him such weakness is unknown he is utterly and absolutely implacable no gifts or prayers no holocausts of human victims can appease or ever for one moment propitiate him symptoms but there are certain people i simply cannot stand a dreariness and sense of death come over me when i meet them i really find it difficult to breathe when they are in the room as if they had pumped all the air out of it wouldn't it be dreadful to produce that effect on people but they never seem to be aware of it i remember once meeting a famous boar i really must tell you about it it shows the unbelievable obtuseness of such people i told this and another story or two with great gusto and talked on of my experiences and sensations till suddenly i noticed in the appearance of my charming neighbour something a slightly glazed look in her eyes a just perceptible irregularity in her breathing which turned that occasion for me into a kind of nightmare. Shadowed. I sometimes feel a little uneasy about that imagined self of mine, the me of my daydreams, who leads a melodramatic life of his own, quite unrelated to my real existence. So one day I shadowed him down the street. He loitered along for a while, and then stood at a shop window and dressed himself out in a gaudy tie and yellow waistcoat then he bought a great sponge and two stuffed birds and took them to lodgings where he led for a while a shady existence next he moved to a big house in mayfair and gave grand dinner parties with splendid service and costly wines his amorous adventures in this region i pass over he soon sold his house and horses gave up his motors dismissed his retinue of servants and went saving two young ladies from being run over on the way to live a life of heroic self-sacrifice among the poor i was beginning to feel encouraged about him when in passing a fishmonger's he pointed at a great salmon and said i caught that fish the incredible 
"'Yes, but they were rather afraid of you.' "'Afraid of me?' "'Yes, so one of them told me afterwards.' I was fairly jiggered. If my personality can inspire fear or respect, the world must be a simpler place than I had thought it. Afraid of a shadow? A poor make-believe like me? Are children more absurdly terrified by a candle in a hollow turnip? Was Bedlam at full moon ever scared by anything half so silly? Terror a pause suddenly fell on our conversation, one of those uncomfortable lapses when we sit with fixed smiles, searching our minds for some remark with which to fill up the unseasonable silence. It was only a moment. But suppose, I said to myself with horrible curiosity, suppose none of us had found a word to say and we had gone on sitting in silence. It is the dread of a something happening, something unknown and awful, that makes us do anything to keep the flicker of talk from dying out. So travelers at night in an unknown forest keep their fires ablaze, in fear of wild beasts lurking ready in the darkness to leap upon them. Pathos when winter twilight falls on my street with the rain, a sense of the horrible sadness of life descends upon me. I think of drunken old women who drown themselves because nobody loves them. I think of Napoleon at St. Helena, and of Byron growing morose and fat in the enervating climate of Italy. Inconstancy the rose that one wears and throws away, the friend one forgets, the music that passes, out of the well-known transitoriness of mortal things, I have made myself a maxim or precept to the effect that it is foolish to look for one face or to listen long for one voice in a world that is, after all, as I know, full of enchanting voices. But all the same, I can never quite forget the enthusiasm with which, as a boy, I read the praises of constancy and true love and the unchanged northern star." the poplar there is a great tree in sussex whose cloud of thin foliage floats high in the summer air the thrush sings in it and blackbirds who fill the late decorative sunshine with a shimmer of golden sound there the nightingale finds her green cloister and in those branches sometimes like a great fruit hangs the lemon-coloured moon in the glare of august when all the world is faint with heat there is always a breeze in those cool recesses always a noise like the noise of water among its lightly hung leaves. But the owner of this tree lives in London, reading books. On the doorstep. I rang the bell as of old. As of old I gazed at the great shining door and waited. But alas, that flutter and beat of the wild heart, that delicious doorstep terror, it was gone. And with it dear, fantastic, panic-stricken youth had rung the bell, flitted around the corner, and vanished forever. Old Clothes Shabby old waistcoat, what made the heart beat that you used to cover? Funny-shaped hat, where are the thoughts that once nested beneath you? Old shoes hurrying along what dim paths of the past did I wear out your soul leather? Youth Oh, dear! this living and eating and growing old, these doubts and aches in the back, and want of interest in the moon and roses. Am I the person who used to wake in the middle of the night and laugh with the joy of living? Who worried about the existence of God, and danced with young ladies till long after daybreak? Who sang old Lang Syne, and howled with sentiment, and more than once gazed at the summer stars through a blur of great romantic tears? Consolation the other day, depressed on the underground, I tried to cheer myself by thinking over the joys of our human lot. But there wasn't one of them for which I seemed to care a hang, not wine, nor friendship, nor eating, nor making love, nor the consciousness of virtue. Was it worth while, then, going up in a lift into a world that had nothing less trite to offer? Then I thought of reading, the nice and subtle happiness of reading. This was enough this joy not dulled by age, this polite and unpunished vice, this selfish, serene, lifelong intoxication. Sir Eustace Carr 
when i read the news about sir eustace carr in the morning paper i was startled like every one else who knew if only by name this young man whose wealth and good looks whose adventurous travels and whose brilliant and happy marriage had made of him an almost romantic figure every now and then one hears of some strange happening of this kind but they are acts so anomalous in such startling contradiction to all our usual ways and accepted notions of life and its value that most of us are willing enough to accept the familiar explanation of insanity or any other commonplace cause which may be alleged financial trouble or some passionate entanglement and the fear of scandal and exposure and then the suicide is forgotten as soon as possible, and his memory shuffled out of the way as something unpleasant to think of. But with a curiosity that is perhaps a little morbid, I sometimes let my thoughts dwell on these cases, wondering whether the dead man may not have carried to the grave with him the secret of some strange perplexity, some passion or craving or irresistible impulse, of which perhaps his intimates, and certainly the coroner's jury, can have had no inkling i had never met or spoken to sir eustace carr the worlds we lived in were very different but i had read of his explorations in the east and of the curious tombs he had discovered somewhere was it not in the nile valley then too it happened and this was the main cause of my interest that at one time i had seen him more than once under circumstances that were rather unusual and now i began to think of this incident in a way it was nothing, and yet the impression haunted me that it was somehow connected with this final act, for which no explanation beyond that of sudden mental derangement had been offered. This explanation did not seem to me wholly adequate, although it had been accepted, I believe, both by his friends and the general public, and with the more apparent reason on account of a strain of eccentricity amounting in some cases almost to insanity, which could be traced, it was said, in his mother's family. I found it not difficult to revive with a certain vividness the memory of those cold and rainy November weeks that I had happened to spend alone some years ago in Venice, and of the churches which I had so frequently haunted. Especially I remembered the great dreary church in the piazza near my lodgings, into which I would often go on my way to my rooms in the twilight. It was the season when all the Venice churches are draped in black, and services for the dead are held in them at dawn and twilight and when i entered this baroque interior with its twisted columns and volutes and high-piled hideous tombs adorned with skeletons and allegorical figures and angels blowing trumpets all so agitated and all so dead and empty and frigid i would find the fantastic darkness filled with glimmering candles and kneeling figures and the discordant noise of chanting there i would sit while outside night fell with the rain on venice the palaces and green canals faded into darkness and the great bells swinging against the low sky sent the melancholy sound of their voices far over the lagoons it was here in this church that i used to see sir eustace carr would generally find him in the same corner when i entered and would sometimes watch his face until the ceremonious extinguishing of the candles one by one left us in shadowy night it was a handsome and thoughtful face and i remember more than once wondering what had brought him to venice in that unseasonable month and why he came so regularly to this monotonous service it was as if some spell had drawn him and now with my curiosity newly wakened i asked myself what had been that spell i also must have been affected by it for i had been there also in his uncommunicating company here i felt was perhaps the answer to my question the secret of the enigma that puzzled me and as i went over my memories of that time and revived its sombre and sometimes sinister fascination i seemed to see an answer looming before my imagination but it was an answer an hypothesis or supposition so fantastic that my common sense could hardly accept it for i now saw that the spell which had been on us both at that time in venice had been nothing but the spell and tremendous incantation of the thought of death 
the dreary city with its decaying palaces and great tomb-encumbered churches had really seemed in those dark and desolate weeks to be the home and metropolis of the great king of terrors and the services at dawn and twilight with their prayers for the dead and funereal candles had been the chanted ritual of his worship now suppose such was the notion that held my imagination suppose this spell which i had felt but for a time and dimly should become to some one a real obsession casting its shadow more and more completely over a life otherwise prosperous and happy might not this be the clue to a history like that of sir eustace carr's not only his interest in the buried east his presence at that time in venice but also his unexplained and mysterious end musing on this half-believed notion i thought of the great personages and great nations we read of in ancient history who have seemed to live with a kind of morbid pleasure in the shadow of this great thought who have surrounded themselves with mementos of death and hideous symbols of its power and who like the egyptians have found their main interest not in the present but in imaginary explorations of the unknown future not on the sunlit surface of this earth but in the vaults and dwelling-places of the dead beneath it since this preoccupation this curiosity this nostalgia has exercised so enormous a fascination in the past i found it not impossible to imagine some modern favorite of fortune falling a victim to this malady of the soul until at last growing weary of other satisfactions he might be drawn to open for himself the dark portal and join the inhabitants of that dim region kings and counselors of the earth princes that had gold who filled their houses with silver this as i say was the notion that haunted me the link my imagination forged between sir eustace carr's presence in that dark phoenician church and his self-caused death some years later but whether it is really a clue to that unexplained mystery or whether it is nothing more than a somewhat sinister fancy of course i cannot say the lord mayor an arctic wind was blowing it cut through me as i stood there the bootblack was finishing his work and complaints but i would be happy sir if only i could make four bob a day he said i looked down at him it seemed absurd the belief of this crippled half-frozen creature that four shillings would make him happy happiness the fabled treasure of some far-away heaven i thought it that afternoon not to be bought with gold not of this earth i said something to this effect but four shillings a day was enough for the boot-black why he said i should be a happy as the lord mayor the burden i know too much i have stuffed too many of the facts of history and science into my intellectuals my eyes have grown dim over books believing in geological periods cave dwellers chinese dynasties and the fixed stars has prematurely aged me why am i to blame for all that is wrong in the world i didn't invent sin and hate and slaughter who made it my duty anyhow to administer the universe and keep the planets to their copernican courses my shoulders are bent beneath the weight of the firmament i grow weary of propping up like atlas this vast and erroneous cosmos under an umbrella from under the roof of my umbrella i saw the washed pavement lapsing beneath my feet the news posters lying smeared with dirt at the crossings the tracks of the buses in the liquid mud on i went through this dreary world of wetness and through how many rains and years shall i still hurry down wet streets middle-aged and then perhaps very old and on what errands asking myself this cheerless question i fade from your vision reader into the distance sloping my umbrella against the wind end of trivia book two More Trivia, Part 1, of Trivia and More Trivia by Logan Pearsall Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A greeting. What funny clothes you wear, dear readers, and your hats. The thought of your hats does make me laugh, and I think your sex theories quite horrid. 
thus across the void of time i send with a wave of my hand a greeting to that quaint remote outlandish unborn people whom we call posterity and whom i like other very great writers claim as my readers urging them to hurry up and get born that they may have the pleasure of reading more trivia reassurance i look at my overcoat and my hat hanging in the hall with reassurance for although i go out of doors with one individuality to-day when yesterday i had quite another yet my clothes keep my various cells buttoned up together and enable all these otherwise irreconcilable aggregates of psychological phenomena to pass themselves off as one person the great adventure before opening the front door i paused for a moment of profound consideration dim-lit shadowy full of menace and unimaginable chances stretched all around my door the many-peopled streets i could hear ominous and muffled the tides of multitudinous traffic sounding along their ways was i equipped for the navigation of those waters armed and ready to adventure out into that dangerous world again gloves money cigarettes matches yes and i had an umbrella for its tempests and a latch-key for my safe return the beatific vision shoving and pushing and shoved and pushed a dishonoured bag of bones about london or carted like a herring in a box through tunnels in the clay beneath it as i bump my head in a bus or hang half suffocated from a greasy strap in the underground i dream like other idealists and saints and social thinkers of a better world than this a world that might be a city of heaven brought down at last to earth one footman flings open the portals of my palace in that new jerusalem for me another unrolls a path of velvet to the enormous motor which floats me swift and silent through the city traffic i leaning back like god on hallowed cushions smoking a big cigar faces almost always the streets are full of dreary-looking people sometimes for weeks on end the poor face-hunter returns unblessed from his expeditions with no provision with which to replenish his daydream larder then one day the plenty is all too great there are princesses at the street crossings queens in the taxicabs beings fair as the dayspring on the tops of buses and the gods themselves can be seen promenading up and down piccadilly the observer talk of ants it's the precise habits the incredible proceedings of human insects i like to note and study walking to-day like a stranger dropped upon this planet towards victoria i chanced to see a female of this species a certain mrs jones of my acquaintance approaching from the opposite direction immediately i found myself performing the oddest set of movements and manoeuvres i straightened my back and simpered i lifted my hat in the air and then seizing the paw of this female i moved it up and down several times giving utterance to a set formula of articulated sounds these anthropological gestures and vocalizations and my automatic performance of them reminded me that it was after all from inside one of them that i was observing these bipeds chaos punctual commonplace keeping all appointments as i go my round in the obvious world a bit of chaos and old night seems to linger on inside me a dark bewilderment of mind a nebulous sea of speculation a looming of shadowy universes out of nothing and their collapse as in a dream the ghost when people talk of ghosts and hauntings i never mention the apparition by which i am pestered the phantom that shadows me about the streets the image or spectre so familiar so like myself and yet so abhorrent which lurks in the plate glass of shop windows or leaps out of mirrors to waylay me the hourglass at the corner of oakley street i stopped for a moment's chat with my neighbour mrs webble who was waiting there for a bus do tell me she asked what you have got in that odd-looking parcel it's an hourglass i said taking it out of its paper wrapping i saw it in a shop in the king's road i've always wanted an hourglass to measure time by what a mystery time really is when you think of it see the sands are running now while we are talking 
I've got here in my hand the most potent, the most enigmatic, the most fleeting of all essences, time, the sad cure for all our sorrows. But I say, there's your bus just starting. You'll miss it if you don't look out. The latch key. I was astonished. I was almost horror-struck by the sight of the new moon at the end of the street. In bewilderment and blake-like wonder I stood and gazed at it on my doorstep. For what was I doing there? I, a wanderer, a pilgrim, a nomad of the desert, with no home save where the evening found me. What was my business on that doorstep? In what commonplace had the moon caught me with a latch-key in my hand? Good practice. We met in an omnibus last evening. And where are you going now? she asked as she looked at me with amusement. I am going, if the awful truth must be told, to dine at Grosvenor Square. Lord, she colloquially replied, and what do you do that for? I do it because I am invited, and besides, I went on, let me remind you of what the Persian mystics say of the saints, that the saints are sometimes rich, that God sometimes endows them with an outward show of wealth to hide them from the profane. Oh, does he? Hides them in Grosvenor Square? Very well, then, I shall tell you the real truth. I shall tell you my real reason for going to dine there. Do you remember what Diogenes answered when they asked him why he had asked for a statue at the public expense? No. What did he say? He said, but I must explain another time. I have to get off here. Good night. I paused, however, at the door of the bus. He said, I called back, I am practicing disappointment. That, uh, you know whom I mean, was his answer. Evasion What do you think of the international situation? asked that foreign countess with her foreign fascinating smile. Was she a spy? I felt I must be careful. What do I think? I evasively echoed, and then carried away by the profound and melancholy interest of this question. Think? I queried. Do I ever really think? Is there anything inside my head but cotton wool? How can I call myself a thinker? What am I, anyhow? I pursued the sad inquiry. A noodle, a pidgeon, a ninny hammer, a bubble on the wave, a leaf in the wind, madam. Dining out. When I think of etiquette and funerals, when I consider the euphemisms and rites and conventions and various costumes with which we invest the acts of our animal existence, when I bear in mind how elegantly we eat our victuals, and remember the series of ablutions and preparations and salutations and exclamations and manipulations I went through when I dined out last evening, I reflect what creatures we are of ceremony, how elaborate, how pompous and polite a simian species. What's wrong? From the corner of the dim half-empty drawing-room where they sat, they could see, in a great mirror, the other dinner guests linger and depart, but none of them were going on. What was the good? To that evening party. They talked of satiety and disenchantment, of the wintry weather, of illness and old age and death. But what really frightens me most in life, said one of them, what gives me a kind of vertigo or shiver is, it sounds absurd, but it's simply the horror of space, l'épouvante sidérale, the dismay of infinity, the black abysses in the Milky Way, the silence of those eternal spaces beyond the furthest stars. But time, said another of the group, surely time is a worse nightmare. Think of it, the past with never a beginning, the future going on forever and ever, and the little present in which we live for a second twinkling between these two black abysses. What's wrong with me, mused the third speaker, is that even the present eludes me. I don't know what it really is. I can never catch the moment as it passes. I am always far ahead or far away behind, and always somewhere else. I am not really here now with you, though I am talking to you. And why should I go to the party? I shouldn't be there either, if I went. My life is all reminiscence and anticipation if you can call it life, if I am not rather a kind of ghost, haunting a past that has ceased to be, or a future that is still more shadowy and unreal. 
it's ghastly in a way this exile and isolation but why speak of it after all they rose and their images too were reflected in the great mirror as they passed out of the drawing-room and dispersed each on his or her way into the winter night at solemn music i sat there hating the exuberance of her bust and her high-coloured wig and how could i listen to music in the close proximity of those loud stockings then our eyes met in both of us the enchanted chord was touched we both looked through the same window into heaven in that moment of musical shared delight my soul and the soul of that large lady joined hands and sang like the morning stars together the goat in the midst of my anecdote a sudden misgiving chilled me had i told them about this goat before and then as i talked there gaped upon me abyss opening beneath abyss a darker speculation when goats are mentioned do i automatically and always tell this story about the goat at portsmouth self-control still i am not a pessimist nor misanthrope nor grumbler i bear it all the burden of public affairs the immensity of space the brevity of life and the thought of the all-swallowing grave all this i put up with without impatience i accept the common lot and if now and then for a moment it seems too much if i get my feet wet or have to wait too long for tea and my soul in these wanes of the moon cries out in french c'est fini i always answer pazienza in italian abbia la santa pazienza the communion of souls so of course i bought it how could i help buying it then lifting the conversation as with lady hislop one always lifts it to a higher level this notion of free will i went on the notion for instance that i was free to buy or not to buy that rare edition seems when you think of it at least to me it seems a wretched notion really i like to feel that i must follow the things i desire as how shall i put it as the tide follows the moon that my actions are due to necessary causes that the world inside me isn't a meaningless chaos but a world of order like the world outside governed by beautiful laws as the stars are governed ah how i love the stars murmured lady hislop what things they say to me they are the pledges of lost recognitions the promise of ineffable mitigations mitigations i gasped feeling for a moment a little giddy always when we meet lady hislop and i have the most wonderful conversations waxworse but one really knows the age one lives in how interesting it would be i said to the lady next me how i wish we could see ourselves as posterity will see us i have said it before but on this occasion i was struck almost thunderstruck by my own remark like a rash enchanter the spirit i had raised myself alarmed me for a queer second i did see ourselves in that inevitable mirror but cadaverous and out of date and palsied a dusty set of old waxworks simpering inanely in the lumber room of time better to be forgotten at once i exclaimed with an emphasis that seemed to surprise the lady next me adjectives but why wasn't i born alas in an age of adjectives why can one no longer write of silver shedding tears and moon-tailed peacocks of eloquent death and the negro and star enameled night where i who move and breathe and place one foot before the other who watch the moon wax and wane and put off answering my letters where shall i find the bliss which dreams and blackbirds voices promise of which the waves whisper and hand organs in streets near paddington faintly sing does it dwell in some island of the south seas or far oasis among deserts and gaunt mountains or only in those immortal gardens imagined by chinese poets beyond the great cold palaces of the moon in the street these eye encounters in the street little touches of love liking faces that ask as they pass are you my new lover 
shall i one day in park lane or oxford street perhaps see the unknown face i dread and look for the abbey at night and as at night i went past the abbey saw its walls towering high and solemn among the autumn stars i pictured to myself the white population in the vast darkness of its interior all that hushed people of heroes not dead i would think them but animated with a still kind of life and at last after all their intolerable toils the sounding tumult of battle and perilous sea-paths resting there tranquil and satisfied and glorious amid the epitaphs and allegorical figures of their tombs those high piled trophied shapeless abbey tombs that long ago they toiled for and laid down their gallant lives to win desperance yes as you say life is so full of disappointment disillusion more and more i ask myself as i grow older what is the good of it all we dress we go out to dinner i went on but surely we walk in a vain show how good this asparagus is i often say asparagus is the most delicious of all vegetables and yet i don't know when one thinks of fresh green peas one can get tired of asparagus as one can of strawberries but tender peas i could eat forever then uh, peaches and melons and there are certain pears too that taste like heaven one of my favorite daydreams for the long afternoon of life is to live alone a formal greedy selfish old gentleman in a square house say in devonshire with a square garden whose walls are covered with apricots and figs and peaches and there are precious pears too of my own planting on espaliers among the paths i shall walk out with a gold-headed cane in the autumn sunshine and just at the right moment i shall pick another pear however that isn't at all what i was going to say chairs in the streets of london there are doorbells i ring i see myself ringing them in certain houses there are chairs covered with chintz or croton in which i sit and talk about life explaining often after tea what i think of it a grievance they are all persons of elegant manners and spotless reputations they seem to welcome my visits and they listen to my anecdotes with unflinching attention i have only one grievance against them they will keep in their houses mawkish books full of stale epithets which when i only seem to smell their proximity produce in me a slight feeling of nausea there are people i believe who are affected in this way by the presence of cats the moon i went in and shook hands with my hostess but no one else took any special notice no one screamed or left the room the quiet murmur of talk went on i suppose i seemed like the others observed from outside no doubt i looked more or less like them but inside seen from within or was it a conceivable hypothesis that we were all alike inside also that all those quietly talking people had got to the moon too in their heads longevity but when you are as old as i am i said to the young lady in pink satin but i don't know how old you are that young lady answered almost archly we were getting on quite nicely oh i'm endlessly old my memory goes back almost forever i come out of the middle ages i am the primitive savage we are all descended from i believe in devil worship and the power of the stars i dance under the new moon naked and tattooed and holy i am a cave dweller a contemporary of mastodons and mammoths i am pleistocene and neolithic and full of the lusts and terrors of the great pre-glacial forests but that's nothing i am millions of years older i am an arboreal ape an aged baboon with all its instincts i am a pre-simian quadruped i have great claws eyes that see in the dark and a long prehensile tail good gracious said the terrified young lady in pink satin then she turned and for the rest of the dinner talked in a hushed voice with her other neighbor in the bus 
as i sat inside that crowded bus so sad so incredible and sordid seemed the fat face of the woman opposite me that i interposed the thought of kilimanjaro that highest mountain of africa between us the grassy slopes and green realms of negro kings from which its dark cone rises the immense dim elephant-haunted forests which clothe its flanks and above the white crown of snow freezing in eternal isolation over the palm trees and deserts of the african equator justification well what if i did put it on a little at that luncheon do I not owe it to my friends to assert now and then my claims to consideration? Ought I always to allow myself to be trampled on and treated as dirt? And how about the saints and patriarchs of the Bible? Didn't Joseph tell of the dream in which his wheat sheaf was exalted? Deborah sang without blame how she arose a mother in Israel, and David boasts of his triumph over the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear? nay in his confabulations with his chosen people does not the creator of the universe himself take every opportunity of impressing on those hebrews his importance his power his glory was i not made in his image the saying of a persian poet all this hurry to dress and go out these journeys in taxicabs or in trains with my packed bag from big railway stations what keeps me going i sometimes ask myself and i remember how in his masnavi a manavi or spiritual couplets jalaluddin muhammad rumi says that our desires the swarm of gaudy thoughts we pursue and follow are short-lived like summer insects and must all be killed before long by the winter of age monotony oh to be becalmed on a sea of glass all day to listen all day to rain on the roof or wind in pine trees to sit all day by a waterfall reading exquisite artificial monotonous persian poems about an oasis garden where it is always spring where roses bloom and lovers sigh and nightingales lament without ceasing and white-robed figures sit in groups by the running water and discuss all day and day after day the meaning of life daydream in the cold and malicious society in which i live i must never mention the soul nor speak of my aspirations if i ever once let these people get a glimpse of the higher side of my nature they would set on me like a pack of wolves and tear me to pieces i wish i had soulful friends refined maiden ladies with ideals and long noses who live at hampstead or putney and play chopin with passion on sad autumn afternoons i would go and have tea with them and talk of the spiritual meaning of beethoven's late sonatas or discuss in the twilight the pathos of life and the larger hope providence but god sees me he knows my beautiful nature and how pure i keep amid all sorts of quite horrible temptations and that is why as i feel in my bones there is a special providence watching over me an angel sent expressly from heaven to guide my footsteps from harm for i never trip up or fall down stairs like other people i am not run over by cabs and buses at street crossings in the worst wind my hat never blows off and if ever any of the great cosmic processes or powers threaten me i believe that god sees it stop it he shouts from his ineffable throne don't you touch my chosen one my pet lamb my beloved leave him alone i tell you action i am no mere thinker no mere creature of dreams and imagination i stamp and post letters i buy new bootlaces and put them in my boots and when i set out to get my hair cut it is with the iron face of those men of empire and unconquerable will those caesars and napoleons whose footsteps shake the earth waiting we met at waterloo as we were paying the same visit we travelled in the train together but when we got out at that country station she found that her boxes had not arrived they might have gone on to the next station i waited with her while inquiries were telephoned down the line it was a mild spring evening side by side we sat in silence on a wooden bench facing the platform 
the bustle caused by the passing train ebbed away the dusk deepened and one by one the stars twinkled out in the serene sky how peaceful it is i remarked at last is there not a certain charm i went on after another pause in waiting like this in silence under the stars it's after all a little adventure is it not a moment with a certain mood and colour and atmosphere of its own i often think i once more mused aloud i often think that it is in moments like this of waiting and hushed suspense that one tastes most fully the savour of life the uncertainty and yet the sweetness of our frail mortal condition so capable of fear and hope so dependent on a million accidents luggage i said after another silence is it not after all absurd that minds which contemplate the universe should cart about with them brushes and boots and drapery and leather boxes suppose all this paltry junk i said giving my suitcase which stood near me a disdainful poke with my umbrella suppose it all disappears what after all does it matter at last she spoke but it's not your luggage she said but mine which is lost the wrong word we were talking of the universe at tea and one of our company declared that he at least was entirely without illusions he had long since faced the fact that nature had no sympathy with our hopes and fears and was completely indifferent to our fate the universe he said was a great meaningless machine man with his reason and moral judgments was the product of blind forces which though they would so soon destroy him he must yet despise to endure this tragedy of our fate with passionless despair never to wince or bow the head or confront the hostile powers with high disdain to fix with eyes of scorn the gorgon face of destiny to stand on the brink of the abyss hurling defiance at the icy stars this he said was his attitude and it produced as you can imagine a very powerful impression on the company as for me i was completely carried away by my enthusiasm by jove that is a stunt i cried ions self-determination one of them insisted arbitration cried another cooperation suggested the mildest of the party confiscation answered an uncompromising female i too became slightly intoxicated by the sounds of these vocables and were they not the cure for all our ills inoculation i chimed in transubstantiation alliteration inundation flagellation and afforestation a figure of speech though i sometimes lay down the law myself on public questions i don't very much care to hear other people do it the heavy talker however who was now holding forth about finance showed such a grasp of his subject and made such mincemeat of a rash opponent that i thought it best for the moment to say nothing so what you allege he triumphed in his overbearing manner is perfectly irrelevant my withers are unwrung it does not affect my position in the least and then i lightly flung my goliath pebble withers i ingenuously asked what are the withers anyhow he turned on me a glance of anger and contempt withers why the the withers it's it's only a figure of speech he stammered oh i said with a look at the company full of suggestion a figure of speech i see a slander but i'm told you don't believe in love now who on earth could have told you that i cried indignantly of course i believe in it there is no one more enthusiastic about love than i am i believe in it at all times and seasons but especially in the spring why just think of it true love amid the apple blossoms lovers who outwake the nightingales of april the touch of hands and lips the clinging of flower-soft limbs together and all this amid the gay musical perfumed landscape of the spring why nothing miss tompkins could be more appropriate and pretty haven't i said so again and again haven't i published it more than once in the weekly papers synthesis 
"'It's awful,' I said. "'I think it's simply wicked the way you tear your friends to pieces.' "'But you do it yourself. You know you do. You analyze and analyze people, and then you make them up again into creatures larger than life.' that's exactly it i answered gravely if i take people to pieces i do it in order to put them together again better than they were before i make them more real so to speak more significant more essentially themselves but to cut them up as you do and leave the fragments lying around anywhere on the floor i can't tell you how cruel and heartless and wrong i think it the age Again, as the train drew out of the station, the old gentleman pulled out of his pocket his great shining watch, and for the fifth, or as it seemed to me, the five hundredth time, he said, we were in the carriage alone together, to the minute, to the very minute, it's a marvelous thing, the railway, a wonderful age. Now, I had been long annoyed by the old gentleman's smiling face, platitudes and piles of newspapers i had no love for the age and an impulse came on me to denounce it allow me to tell you i said that i consider it a wretched and ignoble age where's the greatness of life where's dignity leisure stateliness where's art and eloquence where are your great scholars statesmen let me ask you sir i cried glaring at him where's your gibbon your burke or chatham comfort People often said that there was nothing sadder, she mourned, than the remembrance of past happiness. But to her it seemed that not the way we remembered, but the way we forgot, was the real tragedy of life. Everything faded from us. Our joys and sorrows vanished alike in the irrevocable flux. We could not stay their fleeting. Did I not feel, she asked, the sadness of this forgetting, this outliving all the things we care for, this constant dying, so to speak, in the midst of life? I felt its sadness very much. I felt quite lugubrious about it. And yet, I said, for I did really want to think of something that might console this lamentable lady, and yet can we not find in this fading of recollection some recompense after all? Think, for instance— but what alas could i suggest think i began once more after a moment of reflection think of forgetting and reading over and over again all jane austen's novels appearance and reality it is pleasant to saunter out in the morning sun and idle along the summer streets with no purpose but is it right I am not really bothered by these questions, the awry old puzzles of ethics and philosophies which lurk around the London corners to waylay me. I have got used to them, and the most formidable of all, the biggest bug of metaphysics, the problem which nonpluses the wisest heads on this planet, has become quite a familiar companion of mine. What is reality? I ask myself almost daily. How does the external world exist, materialized in mid-air, apart from my perception? This show of streets and skies, of policemen and perambulators and hard pavements, is it a mere vision, a figment of the mind, or does it remain there, permanent and imposing, when I stop thinking about it? Often, as I saunter along Piccadilly or Bond Street, I please myself with the Barclayan notion that matter has no existence that this so solid-seeming world is all idea, all appearance, that I am carried soft through space inside an immense thought-bubble, a floating diaphanous opal-tinted dream. Loneliness. Is there then no friend, no one who hates Ibsen and problem-plays and the supernatural and Switzerland and adultery as much as I do? Must I live all my life as mute as a mackerel, companionless and uninvited, and never tell anyone what I think of my famous contemporaries? Must I plough always a solitary furrow, and tread the wine-press alone? THE WELSH HARP What charming corners one can find in the immense dinginess of London, and what curious encounters become a part of the London lover's experience! The other day, when I walked a long way out of the Edgware Road and stopped for tea at the Welsh Harp on the banks of the Brent Reservoir, 
i found beyond the modern frontage of this inn an old garden adorned with sham ruins and statues and full of autumn flowers and the shimmer of clear water sitting there and drinking my tea alone as i thought at first in the twilight i became aware that the garden had another occupant that at another table not far from me a vague and not very prosperous-looking woman in a shabby bonnet was sitting with her reticule lying by her also drinking tea and gazing at the afterglow of the sunset an elderly spinster i thought her a dressmaker perhaps or a retired governess one of those maiden ladies who live alone in quiet lodgings and are fond of romantic fiction and solitary excursions as we sat there we two alone in the growing dusk more than once our glances met and a curious relation of sympathy and understanding seemed to establish itself between us we seemed to carry on a dialogue full of tacit avowals yes we seemed to say as our eyes met over our suspended teacups yes beauty romance the bluebird that sings of happiness these are the things we care for the only things that in spite of everything we still care for but where can we find them in the dingy london streets and suburbs and yet our eyes seem to ask each other isn't this garden in its shabby pretentious way romantic isn't it like something in a poem of verlaine's hasn't it now in the dim light a kind of beauty and this mood of meditation after our excellent tea what name if we are honest can we call it by if we do not call it happiness end of more trivia part one More Trivia Part Two of Trivia and More Trivia by Logan Pearsall Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Misapprehension. People often seem to take me for someone else. They talk to me as if I were a person of earnest views and unalterable convictions. What is your opinion of democracy? They ask. Are you in favor of the Channel Tunnel? Do you believe in existence after death? i assume a thoughtful attitude and by means of grave looks and evasive answers i conceal or at least i hope i conceal my discreditable secret the lift what on earth had i come up for i stood out of breath in my bedroom having completely forgotten the errand which had carried me upstairs leaping two steps at a time gloves of course it was my gloves which i had left there but what did gloves matter, I asked myself, in a world, as Dr. Johnson describes it, bursting with misery? Oh, stars and garters, how bored I am by this trite, moralizing way of regarding natural phenomena, this crying of vanity on the beautiful manifestations of mechanical forces, this desire of mine to appear out of doors in appropriate apparel, if it can thus defy and overcome the law of gravitation, if it can lift twelve stone of matter thirty or forty feet above the earth's surface, if it can do this every day and several times a day, and never get out of order, is it not as remarkable and convenient in the house as a hydraulic lift? Sloan Street. When I walk out, middle-aged but still sprightly, and still, if the truth must be told, with an idiot dream in my heart of some romantic encounter, I look at the passers-by, say in Sloan Street, and then I begin to imagine moon-faces more alluring than any I see in that thoroughfare. But then again vaster thoughts visit me, remote metaphysical musings, those faces like moons i imagined all wane as moons wane the passers-by vanish and immortal reason disdaining the day-moth she dwells with turns away to her crystalline sphere of sublime contemplation i am lost out of time i walk on alone in a world of white silence regent's park I wondered, as I passed Regent's Park on my way to Hampstead, what kind of people live in those great stucco terraces and crescents, with their solemn facades and friezes and pediments and statues. People larger than life, I picture the inhabitants of those inexpensive, august, unfashionable houses, people with the dignity of port, 
an amplitude of back, an emphasis of vocabulary and conviction unknown in other regions, dowagers and dignitaries who have retired from a world no longer worthy of them, ex-governors of dominions, unavailing viceroys, superannuated bishops and valutitarian generals, who wear top hats and drive around the park in old-fashioned barouches. A society, I imagine it, not frivolous, not flippant, entirely devoid of double meanings, a society in which the memory of Queen Victoria is still revered, and regrets are still felt, perhaps, for the death of the Prince Consort. Or, as I have sometimes fancied, are those noble mansions the homes of the Victorian statesmen and royal ladies and distinguished-looking murderers who in the nearby waxwork exhibition gaze on the shallow modern generation which chatters and pushes all day before the glassy disapprobation of their eyes? The Aviary peacock vanities great crested cockatoos of glory gay infatuations and painted daydreams what a pity it is all the blue birds of impossible paradises have such beaks and sharp claws that one really has to keep them shut up in their not too cleanly cages st john's wood as i walked on the air soon lightened the throne the altar and the top hat cast fainter shadows the figures of john bright and gladstone and queen victoria faded from my mind i had entered the precincts of st john's wood and as i went past its villas of coquettish aspect with their gay swiss gables their frivolously gothic or italian or almost oriental faces the lighter aspects of existence they represent the air they have of not taking life too seriously began to exert their influence st john's wood is the home in fiction of adventuresses and profligacy and bohemian supper parties often have i read about those foreign countesses of unknown history and incredible fascination who decoy handsome young officials of the foreign officer to these villas and rob them in dim-lit scented bedrooms of important documents but i at least have never too harshly blamed these young diplomatists silent is the street as the mysterious brougham passes lovely the eyes that flash and graceful the white-gloved hand that beckons from the carriage window and how can they resist for they are only human the lure of so adventurous so enchanting an invitation the garden suburb i had often heard of the hampstead garden suburb and the attempt of its inhabitants to create an atmosphere of the higher culture to concentrate, as it were, the essence of the ideal life in one region. But I must now confess that it was in a spirit of profane curiosity that I walked up towards its courts and closes. And when I saw the notices of the Society for Ethical Culture and Handicrafts and Child Study, the lectures on reincarnation, the Holy Grail, the signs of the Zodiac, and the teaching of the Holy Zoroaster, I am afraid I laughed. But how shallow, how thin this laughter soon sounded amid the quiet amenity, the beautiful distinction of this pretty paradise. It was an afternoon of daydreams. The autumnal light under the low clouds was propitious to inner recollection, and as I walked the streets of this ideal city, soothed by the sense of order and beautiful architecture all around me i began to feel that i too was an idealist that here was my spiritual home and that it would be a right and seemly thing to give up the cinemas and come and make my dwelling on this hilltop pictures floated before my eyes of tranquil days days of gardening and handicrafts and lectures evenings spent in perusing the world's masterpieces Although I still frequent the cinemas and spend too much time gazing in at the windows of expensive shops, and the reverie of that afternoon has come to no fruition, yet I feel myself a better person for it. I feel that it marks me off from the mere cynical and worldly. For I at least have had a pisca sight of the promised city. I have made its ideal my own, if but for an afternoon, and only in a daydream sunday calls well i must say reason exclaimed when we found ourselves in the street again 
"'What's the matter now?' I asked uneasily. "'Why are you always trying to be someone else? Why not be what you really are?' "'But what am I really? Again, I ask you. I do hate to see you playing the ass, and think how they must laugh at you.' The glossy and respected image of myself I had left in the house behind us began to tarnish. "'And what next?' my querulous companion went on. "'What will you be in South Kensington, I wonder? A sad and solitary Satan, disillusioned and distinguished, or a bluff, breezy sailor, fond of his bottle and his boon companions?' An Anomaly When people embellish their conversation with a glitter of titles, and drag into it self-aggrandizing anecdotes, though I laugh at this peacock vein in them, I do not harshly condemn it. Nay, since I too am human, since I too belong to the great household, would it be surprising if, say, once or twice in my life, I also should have gratified this tickling relish of the tongue? No, but what is surprising is the way that, as I feel, I alone always escape detection, always throw dust in other people's eyes. THE LISTENER the topic was one of my favorite topics of conversation, but I didn't at all feel, on this occasion, that it was I who was speaking. No, it was the truth shining through me, the light of the revelation which I had been chosen to proclaim and blazon to the world. No wonder they were all impressed by my moving tones and gestures. No wonder even the fastidious lady, whom it was most difficult to please, kept watching me with almost ecstatic attention. As a cloud may obscure the sun in its glory, so from some morass of memory arose a tiny mist of words to darken my mind for a moment. I brushed them aside. They had no meaning. Sunning myself in the mirror of those eyes, never for a moment could I credit that devil-suggested explanation of their gaze. Oh, no, that phrase I had heard, I had heard, was a nonsense phrase. The words, she mimics you to perfection, were nothing but a bit of unintelligible jabber. Above the Clouds I do so hate gossip, she murmured. How I hate it, too, I heard myself exclaim. There is so much that is good and noble in human nature. Why not talk of that? Why not, indeed, I sighed. I always feel that it is one's own fault if one dislikes people or finds them boring. How I agree with you, I cried sincerely. But people are nowadays so cynical. They sneer at everything that makes life worth living. Love, faith, friendship. And yet those very names are so lovely that even when used in mockery they shed a radiance, they shine like stars. How beautifully you put it! I have so enjoyed our talk. I had enjoyed it, too, and felt all the better for it, only a little giddy and out of breath, as if I had been up in a balloon. THE BUBBLE Walking home at night, troubled by the world's affairs and with the national debt crushing down my weak shoulders, I sometimes allow my thoughts an interlude of solace. From the jar in which I keep my vanity bottled, I remove the cork, out rushes that friendly gin, and swells up and fills the sky. I walk on lightly through another world, a world in which I cut a very different figure. I shall not describe that exquisite, evanescent universe. Even for me tis but the bubble of a moment. I soon snuff it out, or of itself it melts in the thin air. CAUTION With all that I know about life, all this cynical and sad knowledge of what happens and must happen, all the experience and caution and disillusion stored and packed in the uncanny, cold, gray matter of my cerebrum, with all this inside my head, how can I ever dream of banging it against the stars? Desires. These exquisite and absurd fancies of mine, little curiosities and greedinesses, and impulses to kiss and touch and snatch, and all the vanities and artless desires that nest and sing in my heart like birds in a bush. All these, we are now told, are an inheritance from our prehuman past, and were hatched long ago in very ancient swamps and forests. But what of that? 
I like to share in the dumb delights of birds and animals, to feel my life drawing its sap from roots deep in the soil of nature. I am proud of those bright-eyed, furry, four-footed progenitors, and not at all ashamed of my cousins the tigers and apes and peacocks. Moments awful moments why yes of course i said life is full of them let me think to find other people's unposted letters in an old pocket to be seen looking at oneself in a street mirror or overheard talking of the ideal to a duchess to refuse nuns who come to the door to ask for subscriptions or to be lent by a beautiful new acquaintance a book she has written full of mystical slip-slop or dreadful musings in an old-world garden. The Epitaph But perhaps he is a friend of yours, said my lips. Is it safe? my eyes asked. Dare I tell you what I think of him? It was safe. Only silence fell upon them, those sad ones, who at my decease should murmur, He never said of any one an unkind word. Alas, farewell, breathed that boyish daydream of my funeral, as it faded. Interruption Life, said a gaunt widow, with a reputation for being clever, life is a perpetual toothache. In this vein the conversation went on. The familiar topics were discussed of labor troubles, epidemics, cancer, tuberculosis, and taxation. Near me there sat a little old lady who was placidly drinking her tea and taking no part in the melancholy chorus. "'Well, I must say,' she remarked, turning to me and speaking in an undertone, "'I must say I enjoy life.' "'So do I,' I whispered. "'When I enjoy things,' she went on, "'I know it. Eating, for instance, the sunshine, my hot water bottle at night. Other people are always thinking of unpleasant things. It makes a difference,' she added as she got up to go with the others. "'All the difference in the world,' I answered." It's too bad that I had no chance for a longer conversation with this wise old lady. I felt that we were congenial spirits and had a lot to tell each other, for she and I are not among those who fill the mind with garbage. We make a better use of that divine and adorable endowment. We invite thought to share, and by sharing to enhance, the pleasures of the delicate senses. We distill, as it were, an elixir from our golden moments, keeping out of the shining crucible of consciousness everything that tastes sour. I do wish that we could have discussed at greater length, like two alchemists, the theory and practice of our art. The Ear Trumpet They were talking of people I did not know. How do they spend their time there? someone asked. Then I, who had been sitting too long silent, raised my voice. Ah, that's a mysterious question, when you think of it how people spend their time. We only see them, after all, in glimpses. But what, I often wonder, do they do in their hushed and shrouded hours, in all the interstices of their lives? In the what? In the times, I mean, when no one sees them. In the intervals. But that isn't the word you used. It's the same thing, the interstices. Of course, there was a deaf lady present. What did you say? she inquired holding out her ear-trumpet for my answer. Guilt. What should I think of? I asked myself as I opened my umbrella. How should I amuse my imagination that harsh, dusky, sloshy winter afternoon as I walked to Bedford Square? Should I think of Arabia or exotic birds, of albatrosses or of those great condors who sleep on their outspread wings in the blue air above the Andes? But a sense of guilt oppressed me. What had I done, or left undone? And the shadowy figures that seemed to menace and pursue me? Yes, I had wronged them. It was again those Polish poets. It was Mikulitz, Slowaki, Szymanowicz, Krasicki, Kokchanowski, of all whose works I had never read a word. Cadogan Gardens Out of the fog a dim figure accosted me. I beg your pardon, sir, but could you tell me how to get to Cadogan Gardens? Cadogan Gardens? I am afraid I am lost myself. Perhaps, sir, I added, we two seemed oddly alone and intimate in that white world of mystery together. Perhaps, sir, you can tell me where I can find the gardens I am looking for? I breathed their name. 
hesperian gardens the voice repeated i don't think i have ever heard of hesperian gardens oh surely i cried the gardens of the sunset and the singing maidens but what i am really looking for i confided to that dim seen figure what i am always hoping to find is the fortunate abodes the happy orchard the paradise our parents lost so long ago the rescue as i sat there hopeless with my coat and hat on in my bedroom i felt i had no hold on life no longer the slightest interest in it to gain all that the world could give i would not have raised a listless finger and it was entirely without intention that i took a cigarette and felt for matches in my pocket it was the act of an automaton of a corpse that twitches a little after life has left it but when i found that i hadn't any matches that hang it there wasn't a box of matches anywhere then with this vexation life came flooding back the warm familiar sense of my own existence with all its exasperation and incommunicable charm charm speaking of charm i said there is one quality which i find very attractive though most people don't notice it and rather dislike it if they do that quality is observation you read of it in eighteenth-century books a man of much observation they say so few people i went on really notice things they live in theories and thin dreams and look at you with unseeing eyes they take very little interest in the real world but the observers i speak of find it a source of inexhaustible fascination nothing escapes them they can tell at once what the people they meet are like where they belong their profession the kind of houses they live in the slightest thing is enough for them to judge by a tone of voice a gesture a way of putting on the hat i always judge people one of the company remarked by their boots it's people feet i look at first and boot laces now what an awful lot boot laces can tell you as i slipped my feet back under my chair i subjected my theory of charm to a rapid revision caravans always over the horizon of the sahara move these soundless caravans of camels swaying with their padded feet across the desert i imagine till in the shadowy distance of my mind they fade away and vanish the suburbs what are the beliefs about god and grosvenor gardens the surmises of south kensington concerning our fate beyond the grave on what grounds does life seem worth living in pimlico and how far in the cromwell road do they follow or think they follow the precepts of the sermon on the mount if i can but dimly discern the ideals of these familiar regions how much more am i in the dark about the inner life of the great outer suburbs in what works of local introspection can i study the daydreams of brixton the curiosities and discouragements of camberwell or ealing more than once i have paused before a suburban villa telling myself that i had after all but to ring the bell and go in and ask them but alas they would not tell me they could not tell me even if they would the concerto what a beautiful movement she murmured as the music paused beautiful i roused myself to echo though i hadn't heard a note immediately i found myself again in the dock and again the trial began that ever-recurring criminal action in which i am both judge and culprit all the jury and the advocate on either side i now pleaded my other respectable attainments and previous good character and winning a favourable verdict i dropped back into my dream letting the violin wail unheard through the other movements and the grand piano tinkle somewhere somewhere far below the horizon there is a city some day i shall sail to find that sunbright harbour by what star i shall steer my vessel or where that seaport lies i know not but somehow through calms and storms and all the vague sea noises i shall voyage until at last some mountain peak will rise to tell me i am near my destination or i shall see some day at dusk a lighthouse twinkling at its port the platitude it's after all the little things in life that really matter i exclaimed 
i was as much chagrined as they were flabbergasted by this involuntary outbreak but i have become an expert in that taoist art of disintegration which yen hui described to confucius as the art of sitting and forgetting i have learnt to lay aside my personality in awkward moments to dissolve this self of mine into the all-pervading to fall back in fact into the universal flux and sit as i now sat there a blameless lump of matter rolled on according to the heavens rolling with rocks and stones and trees the fetish enshrined in a box of white pasteboard upstairs i keep a black ceremonial object tis my link with christendom and the world of grave custom only on sacred occasions does it make its appearance only at some great tribal dance of my race to pageants of woe i convey it or of the hugest felicity at great hallelujahs of wedlock or at last valedictions i hold it bareheaded as i bow before altars and tombs the echo now and then from the other end of the table words and phrases reached us as we talked what do they mean by complexes she asked oh it's only one of the catchwords of the day i answered everything's a complex just now the talk of most people i went on is simply how shall i put it simply the ticking of clocks it marks the hour but it has no other interest but i like to think for myself to be something more than a mere mouthpiece of the age i live in a mere sounding-board and echo of contemporary chatter just listen i said as again their raised voices reached our ears it's simply one of the catchwords of the day someone was shouting the merest echo of contemporary chatter the scavenger my parlour-maid and cook both gave notice my stomach is not at all what it should be of course the telephone was out of order the coal they sent was all stones and coal dust all the electric wiring has had to be renewed i find it impossible to digest potatoes my aunt has had to have eighteen of her teeth extracted am i nothing but a dustbin or kitchen sink for other people's troubles have i no agonies no indigestions of my own the hotbed it was too much the news in the paper was appalling central europe and the continent of asia in a state of chaos no comfort anywhere tempests in the channel earthquakes famines strikes insurrections the burden of the mystery the weight of all this incorrigible world was really more than i could cope with to prepare a hotbed for early vegetables equal quantities are taken of horse manure and fallen leaves a large heap is built in alternate layers i read with passionate interest of those materials it is left for several days and then turned over the site of the hotbed should be sheltered from cold winds but open to the sunshine early and dwarf varieties of potatoes should be chosen asparagus plants may be dug up from the open garden aphasia but you haven't spoken a word you ought to tell us what you think the truth is i whispered hoarsely in her unaverted ear the truth is i talk too much think of all the years i have been wagging my tongue think how i shall go on wagging it till it's smothered in dust and the worst of it is i went on hoarsely vociferating the horror is that no one understands me i can never make clear to any one my view of the world i may wear my tongue to the stump and no one will ever know i shall go down to the grave and no one will know what i mean magic do you think there are ghosts she foamed her eyes ablaze do you believe in magic i had no intention of discussing the supernatural with this spook enthusiast magic i mused aloud what a beautiful word magic is when you think of it are you interested in etymology i asked to my mind there is nothing more fascinating than the derivation of words it's full of the romance and wonder of real life and history think of magic for instance it comes as no doubt you know from the magi or ancient priests of persia don't you love our deposit of persian words in english to me they glitter like jewels in our northern speech 
magic and paradise for instance and the names of flowers and gems and rich fruits and tissues tulip and lilac and jasmine and peach and lapis lazuli i chanted waving my hands to keep off the spooks and orange and azure and scarlet mrs back mrs back would be down in a few minutes so i waited in the drawing-room of this new acquaintance who had so kindly invited me to call it is indiscreet but i cannot help it if i am left alone in a room i cannot help peering about at the pictures and ornaments and books interiors the habitations people make for their souls are so fascinating and tell so much they interest me like seashells or the nests of birds a lover of switzerland i inferred has travelled in the east the complete works of canon farrar that big bust with whiskers is mendelssohn no doubt good heavens a stuffed cat and that moorish plaque is rather awful still some of the nicest people have no taste then i saw the clock one look at that pink china clock with the face of a monkey was enough softly from that drawing-room softly i stole downstairs and closed the front door of that house softly behind me whiskers there was once a young man who thought he saw life as it really is who prided himself on looking at it grimly in the face without illusions and he went on looking at it grimly as he thought for a number of years this was his notion of himself but one day meeting some very young people he saw reflected as it were in their eyes a bland old gentleman with a white waistcoat and victorian whiskers a lover of souls and sunsets and noble solutions for all problems that was what he saw in the eyes of those atrocious young men the spelling lesson the anecdote which had paused the laughter of those young people was not a thing to joke about i expressed my conviction briefly but the time-honoured word i made use of seemed unfamiliar to them they looked at each other and began whispering together then one of them asked in a hushed voice it's what did you say i repeated my monosyllable loudly again they whispered together and again their spokesman came forward uh, do you mind telling us how you spell it i spell it with a w i shouted w r o n g wrong jeunesse mind you i don't say that their eyes aren't bigger than ours their eyelashes longer their faces more pink and plump and they can skip about with an agility of limb which we cannot equal but all the same a great deal too much is made of these painted dolls think of the thinness of their conversation depicted in gaudy tints on the covers of paper novels they look well enough and they make a better appearance in punts i admit than we do but is that a reason why they should be allowed to disturb the decorum of tables and interrupt with their giggles and squeaks our grave consultations hanging on if it didn't all depend on me if there was any one else to decide the destinies of europe if i wasn't bound to vindicate the truth on all occasions and shout down every falsehood standing alone in arms against a sea of error and holding desperately in place the hook from which truth and righteousness and good taste hang as by a thread and tremble over the unspeakable abyss if but for a day or two it cannot be i cannot let art and civilization go crashing into chaos suppose the sky should fall in while i was napping suppose the round world should take its chance to collapse into stardust again superannuation what an intolerable young person i exclaimed the moment he had left the room how can one sit and listen to such folly the arrogance and ignorance of these young men and the things they write and their pictures it's all pose and self-advertisement i tell you they have no reverence i gobbled now why do i do it i know it turns the hair gray and stiffens the joints why then by denouncing them in this unhygienic fashion do i talk myself into an invalid and old fogey before my time at the club it's the result of board-school education it's the popular press it's the selfishness of the working classes 
it's the cinema it's the jews paid agitators the decay of faith the disintegration of family life i put it down i said to sunspots if you want to know what i think i went inexorably on if you ask me the cause of all this modern unrest delay i was late for breakfast this morning for i was delayed in my heavenly hot bath by the thought of all the other earnest thinkers who at that very moment i had good reason to believe it were blissfully soaking the time away in hot baths all over london smiles when people smile to themselves in the street when i see the face of an ugly man or uninteresting woman light up faces it would seem not exactly made for happy smiling i wonder from what visions within those smiles are reflected from what footlights what gay and incredible scenes they gleam of glory and triumph the dawn my imagination has its dancing places like the dawn in homer there are terraces with balustrades and marble fountains where ideal beings smile at my approach there are ilex groves and beech trees in whose shadows i hold forth forever gardens fairer than all earthly gardens where groups of ladies grow never weary of listening to my voice the pair but every one is enthusiastic about the book i protested well what if they are was the answer i too am a superior person but the predicament was awkward to appear the dupe of a vulgar admiration to be caught crying stale fish at a choice luncheon party oh of course i hit back i know it's considered the thing just now to despise the age one lives in no one even in balham will admit that they have read the books of the day but my attitude has always been what had it been i had to think in a hurry I, I have always felt that it was more interesting after all to belong to one's own epoch to share its dated and unique vision that flying glimpse of the great panorama which no subsequent generation can ever recapture to be elizabethan in the age of elizabeth romantic at the height of the romantic movement but it was no good i saw it was no good so i took a large pear and eat it in silence i know a good deal about pears and am particularly fond of them this one was a doyenne au commis the most delicious kind of all insomnia sometimes when i am cross and cannot sleep i began an angry contest with the opinions i object to into the room they flock those bat-like monsters of wrong belief and darkness and though they glare at me with the daylight faces of bullying opponents and their voices are the voices that often shout me down in argument yet in these nocturnal controversies it is always my assertions that admit no answer i do not spare them it is now their turn to be lashed to fury and made to eat their words reading philosophy the abstractness of the relation on the other hand brings to consciousness no less strongly the foreignness of the idea to natural phenomena in its widest formulation uh, mechanically i turned the page but what on earth was it all about some irrelevant fancy must have been fluttering between my spectacles and the printed paper i turned and caught the pretty daydream to be a wit yes while my eyes were reading hegel i had stolen out of myself to amaze society with my epigrams each conversation i had crowned at its most breathless moment with words of double meaning which had echoed all through london feared and famous all my lifetime for my repartees when at last had come the last sad day when my ashes had been swept at last into an urn of moderate dimensions still then had i lived upon the lips of men still had my plays on words been echoed my sayings handed down in memoirs to ensuing ages moral triumph when i see motors gliding up at night to great houses in the fashionable squares i journey in them i ascend in imagination the grand stairways of those palaces and ushered with eclat into dining-rooms of splendour i sun myself in the painted smiles of the mayfair jezebels and glitter in that world of wigs and rouge and diamonds like a star 
there i quaff the elixir and sweet essence of mundane triumph eating truffles to the sound of trumpets and feasting at sunrise on lobster salad and champagne but it's all dust it's all emptiness and ashes and i retire to an imagined desert to contend with demons to overcome in holy combats unspeakable temptations and purge by prodigious abstinences my heart of base desire for this is the only imperishable victory this is the true immortal garland this triumph over the predilections of our fallen nature crowns us with a satisfaction which the vainglory of the world can never give End of More Trivia, Part 2more trivia part three of trivia and more trivia by logan pearsall smith this librivox recording is in the public domain a vow like the aztec emperors of ancient mexico who took a solemn oath to make the sun pursue his wonted journey i too have vowed to cooperate and help sustain the solar system vowed that by no vexed thoughts of mine no attenuating doubts nor incredulity nor malicious scepticism nor hypercritical analysis shall the great frame and first principles of things be compromised or shaken the springs of action what am i what is man i had looked into a number of books for an answer to this question before i came on jeremy bentham's simple and satisfactory explanation man is a mechanism moved by just so many springs of action these springs he enumerates in elaborate tables and glancing over them this morning before getting up i began with charity all-embracing benevolence love of knowledge laudable ambition godly zeal then i waited but there was no sign or buzz of any wheel beginning to move in my inner mechanism i looked again i saw arrogance ostentation vainglory abomination rage fury revenge and i was about to leap from my bed in a paroxysm of passions when fortunately my eye fell on another set of motives love of ease indolence procrastination sloth in the cage what i say is what i say i vociferate as a parrot in the great cage of the world i hop screeching what i say is from perch to perch shrinkage sometimes my soul floats out beyond the constellations then all the vast life of the universe is mine then again it evaporates it shrinks it dwindles and of all that flood which overbrimmed the bowl of the great cosmos there is hardly enough now left to fill a teaspoon voices you smoke too much whispers the still small voice of conscience you are a failure nobody likes you self-contempt keeps muttering what's the good of it all sighs disillusion arid as a breath from the sahara i can't tell you how all these voices bore me but i can listen all day with grave attention to that suave bosom jesuit who keeps on unweariedly proving that everything i do is done for the public good and all my acts and appetites and inclinations in the most amazing harmony with pure reason and the dictates of the moral law Evanescence how the years pass and life changes how all things float down the stream of time and vanish how friendships fade and illusions crumble and hopes dissolve and solid piece after piece of soap melts away in our hands as we wash them complacency dove gray and harmless as a dove full of piety and innocence and pure thoughts my soul brooded unaffectedly within me i was only half listening to that shrill conversation and i began to wonder as more than once in little moments like this of self-esteem i have wondered whether i might not claim to be something more after all than a mere echo or compilation might not claim in fact to possess a distinct personality of my own might it not be worth while i now asked myself to follow up this pleasing conjecture to retire like descartes from the world and spend the rest of life as he spent it trying to prove my own existence 
my portrait for after all i am no amoeba no mere sack and stomach i am capable of discourse can ride a bicycle look up trains in bradshaw in fact i am and calmly boast myself a human being that masterpiece of nature a rational polite meat-eating man what stellar collisions and conflagrations what floods and slaughters and enormous efforts has it not cost the universe to make me of what astral periods and cosmic processes am i not the crown and wonder where then is the esplanade or alp or earth dominating terrace for my sublime statue the landscape of palace and triumphal arches for the background of my portrait stairs of marble flung against the sunset not too narrow and ignoble for me to pause with ample gesture on their balustraded flights the rationalist occultisms incantations glimpses of the beyond intimations from another world all kinds of supernaturalisms are distasteful to me i cling to the known world of common sense and explicable phenomena and i was much put out to find this morning a cabalistic inscription written in letters of large menace on my bathroom floor tam ha tab what could be the meaning of these cryptic words and how on earth had they got there like belshazzar my eyes were troubled by this writing and my knees smote one against the other till majestic reason deigning to look downward from her contemplation of eternal causes spelt backwards for me with a pitying smile the homely harmless inscription on the bath mat which was lying there wrong side up thoughts one autumn a number of years ago i forget the exact date but it was a considerable time before the war i spent a few weeks in venice in lodgings that looked out on an old venetian garden at the end of the garden there was a rustic temple and on its pediment stood some naked decayed gesticulating statues heathen gods and goddesses i vaguely thought them and above among the yellowing trees i could see the belfry of a small convent a convent of nuns bowed to contemplation who were immured there for life and never went outside the convent walls the belfry was so near that when towards dusk the convent bell began to ring against the sky i could see its bell rope and clapper moving and sometimes as i sat there at my window i would think about the mysterious existence so near me of those life-renouncing virgins very clearly it comes back to me the look of that untidy garden of those gesticulating statues and of that convent bell swinging against the sky but the thoughts that i thought about those nuns i have completely forgotten they were probably not of any special interest phrases is there after all any solace like the solace and consolation of language when i am disconcerted by the unpleasing aspects of existence when for me as for hamlet this fair creation turns to dust and stubble it is not in metaphysics nor in religion that i seek reassurance but in fine phrases the thought of gazing on life's evening star makes of ugly old age a pleasing prospect if i call death mighty and unpersuaded it has no terrors for me i am perfectly content to be cut down as a flower to flee as a shadow to be swallowed like a snowflake on the sea these similes soothe and effectually console me i am sad only at the thought that words must perish like all things mortal that the most perfect metaphors must be forgotten when the human race is dust but the iniquity of oblivion blindly scattereth her poppy disenchantment life i often thought would be so different if i only had one but in the meantime i went on fastening scraps of paper together with pens opalescent infinitely desirable in the window of a stationer's shop around the corner gleamed the paste pot of my daydreams every day i passed it but every day my thoughts were distracted by some hope or disenchantment some metaphysical perplexity or giant preoccupation with the world's woe and then one morning my pens gave out i met this crisis with manly resolution putting on my hat i went round the corner and bought three paste pots and calmly took them home 
at last the spell was broken but oh at what a cost unnerved and disenchanted i sat facing those pots of nauseating paste with nothing to wait for now but death ask me no more where are the snows of yesteryear ask me no more the fate of nightingales and roses and where the old moons go or what becomes of last year's oxford poets fame somewhat furtively i bowed to the new moon in knightsbridge the little old ceremony was a survival no doubt of dark superstition but the wish that i breathed was an inheritance from a much later epoch twas an echo of greece and rome the ideal ambition of poets and heroes the thought of it seemed to float through the air in starlight and music i saw in a bright constellation those stately immortals their great names rang in my ears may i too i whispered incredulous as i lifted my hat to the unconcerned moon news items in spite of the delicacy of my moral feelings and my unrelaxed solicitude for the maintenance of the right principles of conduct i find i can read without tears of the retired colonels who forge checks and the ladies of unexceptional position who are caught pilfering furs in shops somehow the sudden lapses of respected people odd indecorums backbitings bigamies embezzlements and attempted chastities the surprising leaps they make now and then out of propriety into the police courts somehow news items of this kind do not altogether how shall i put it well they don't absolutely blacken the sunshine for me and clergymen if a clergyman slips up do not i pray you gentle reader grieve on my account too much joy sometimes at breakfast sometimes in a train or empty bus or on the moving stairs at charing cross i am happy the earth turns to gold and life becomes a magical adventure only yesterday travelling alone to sussex i became light-headed with this sudden joy the train seemed to rush to its adorable destination through a world new-born in splendor bathed in a beautiful element fresh and clear as on the morning of creation even the colored photographs of south coast watering places in the railway carriage shone with the light of paradise upon them brighton faced me next to it divine south sea beckoned then i saw the beach at sidmouth the tillywhim caves near swanage was it in those unhaunted caves or amid the tumult of life which hums about the worthing bandstand that i should find bliss in its quintessence or on the pier at st peter port perhaps in the channel islands amid that crowd who watch in eternal ecstasy the ever arriving never disembarking weymouth steamer in arcady when i retire from london to my rural solitudes and taste once more as always those pure delights of nature which the poets celebrate walks in the unambitious meadows and the ever-satisfying companionship of vegetables and flowers i am nevertheless haunted now and then but tell it not to shelley skylock nor whisper to wordsworth daffodils the disconcerting secret i am incongruously beset by longings of which the lake poets never sang echoes and images of the abandoned city discomposed my archidizing i hear in the babbling of brooks the delicious sound of london gossip and newsboys voices in the cries of birds sometimes the gold-splashed distance of a country lane seems to gleam at sunset with the posters of the evening papers i dream at dawn of dinner invitations when like a telephone call i hear the greenfinch trill his electric bell worries in the woods about my garden and familiar precincts lurk the fears of life all threaten me some i may escape of others i am the destined and devoted victim sooner or later and yet in any case how soon i shall fall as i have seen others fall touched by an unseen hand but i do not think of these terrors often though i seem to hear them sometimes moving in the thickets it is the little transitory worries that bite and annoy me querulous insects born of the moment and perishing with the day things to write 
what things there are to write if one could only write them my mind is full of gleaming thoughts gay moods and mysterious moth-like meditations hover in my imagination fanning their painted wings they would make my fortune if i could catch them but always the rarest those freaked with azure and the deepest crimson flutter away beyond my reach the childish and ever baffled chase of these filmy nothings often seems for one of sober years in a sad world a trifling occupation but have i not read of the great kings of persia who used to ride out to hawk for butterflies nor deemed this pastime beneath their royal dignity property i should be very reluctant to think that there was anything fishy or fraudulent about the time-honoured institution of private property it is endorsed by society defended by the church maintained by the law and the slightest tampering with it severely punished by judges in large horsehair wigs oh certainly it must be all right i have a feeling that it is all right and one of these days i will get someone to explain why the world keeps on putting adequate sums of its currency into my pocket but of course it's all right in a fix to go or not to go did i want or not want to bicycle over to tea with the hanbury belchers at pokemore wouldn't it be pleasanter to stay at home i like the hanbury belchers or did i really like them still it might be pleasant but how beforehand can one ever tell experience i was still i felt as ignorant of life as a newborn infant experience has taught me nothing what i needed was some definite a priori principle some deep conception of the meaning of existence in the light of which problems of this kind would solve themselves at once i leant my bicycle against the gate and sat down to ponder the matter out calling to mind the moral debates of the old philosophers i meditated on that summum bonum or a sovereign felicity of which they argued but from their disputes and cogitations what came back most vividly what seemed to fall upon one almost in a hush of terror was that paralysis or dread balance of desire they imagined the predicament in fact of that philosophic quadruped who because he found in each of them precisely the same attraction stood unable to move between two bundles of hay until he perished of hunger vertigo no i don't like it i can't approve of it i have always thought it most regrettable that serious and ethical thinkers like ourselves should go scuttling through space in this undignified manner is it seemly that i at my age should be hurled with my books of reference and bedclothes and hot water bottle across the sky at the unthinkable rate of nineteen miles a second as i say i don't at all like it this universe of astronomical whirligigs makes me a little giddy that god should spend his eternity which might be so much better employed in spinning countless solar systems and skylarking like a great child with tops and teetotums is not this a serious scandal i wonder what all our circumgyrating monotheists really do think of it the evil eye drawn by the unfelt wind of my little sail over the shallow estuary i lay in my boat lost in a dream of mere existence the cool water glided through my trailing fingers and leaning over i watched the sands that slid beneath me the weeds that languidly swayed with the boat's motion i was the cool water i was the gliding sand and the swaying weeds i was the sea and sky and sun i was the whole vast universe then between my eyes and the sandy bottom a mirrored face looked up at me floating on the smooth film of water over which i glided at one look from that too familiar and yet how sinister and goblin a face my immeasurable soul collapsed like a wrecked balloon i shrank sadly back into my named personality and sat there shabby hot and very much bored with myself in my little boat the epithet occult night-wandering enormous honey-pale 
the morning paper lay there unopened i knew i ought to look at the news but i was too busy just then trying to find an adjective for the moon the magical unheard-of moony epithet which could i only find or invent it what then would matter the sublunary quakes and conflicts of this negligible earth the garden party yes i suppose it is rather a dull garden party i agreed though my local pride was a little hurt by the disdain of that visiting young woman for our rural society still we have some interesting neighbors when you get to know them now that fat lady over there in purple do you see her mrs turnbull she believes in hell believes in eternal torment and that old gentleman with whiskers and white spats is convinced that england is tottering on the very brink of the abyss the pie-faced lady he is talking to was she asserts mary queen of scots in a previous existence and our curate well we're proud of our curate he's a great cricketer and a kind of saint as well they say he goes out in winter at three o'clock in the morning and stands up to his neck in a pond praying for sinners Belchmetz. How depressed you look! What on earth's the matter? Central Europe, I said, and the chaos in China is somewhat awful. There's a threatened shortage, too, of beer in Copenhagen. But why should that worry you? Oh, it doesn't. It's what I said to Mrs. Rumble. I do say such idiotic things. She asked me to come to see them. I shall be delighted, I said, as delighted but it's your fault for lending me that book of siamese translations as delighted i said mrs rumble as a royal flamingo when he alights upon a cluster of lotuses bogies i remember how charmed i was with these new acquaintances to whose house i had been taken that afternoon to call i remember the gardens through which we sauntered with peaches ripening on the sunny walls i remember the mellow light on the old portraits in the drawing-room the friendly atmosphere and tranquil voices and how as the quiet stream of talk flowed on one subject after another was pleasantly mirrored on its surface till at a chance remark there was a sudden change and darkening an angry swirl as if a monster were raising its head above the waters what was it about the dreadful disputation into which we were plunged in spite of desperate efforts to clutch at other subjects was it uh, tariff reform or table wrapping bacon and shakespeare disestablishment perhaps or anti-vivisection what did any of us know or really care about it what force what fury drove us into saying the stupid intolerant denunciatory things we said that made us feel we should rather die than not say them how could a group of humane polite and intelligent people be so suddenly transformed into barking animals why do we let these abstractions and implacable dogmatisms take possession of us glare at each other through our eyes and fight their frenzied conflicts in our persons life without the rancors and ever-recurring battles of these bogies might be so simple friendly affectionate and pleasant life enhancement i was simply telling them at tea the details of my journey how late the train had been in starting how crowded the railway carriage how i had mislaid my umbrella and nearly lost my gladstone bag but how i enjoyed making them listen what a sense of enhanced existence i found it gave me and to think that i have pitied bores to force my doings my interests my universe with my bag and umbrella down their throats eclipse a mild radiance and the scent of flowers filled the drawing-room whose windows stood open to the summer night i thought our talk delightful the topic was one of my favorite topics i had much that was illuminating to say about it and i was a little put out when we were called to the window to look at the planet jupiter which was shining in the sky just then we were told with great brilliance in turns through a telescope we gazed at that planet i thought the spectacle overrated but said nothing not for the world not for any number of worlds would i have wished them to guess why i was displeased with that glittering star the pyramid 
to read gibbon i said as we paced that terrace in the sunshine to peruse his metallic melancholy pages and then forget them to reread and reforget the decline and fall to fill the mind with that great sad meaningless panorama of history and then to watch it fade from the memory as it has faded from the glass of time as she turned to me with a glance full of enthusiasm what is so enchanting i asked myself as the dawn of an acquaintance with a lovely woman with whom one can share one's thoughts but those dawns are too often false dawns it was her remark about history how she believed the builders of the great pyramid had foreseen and foretold many events of modern history which made a gigantic shadow a darkness as of egypt loom between us on the terrace the full moon suddenly one night low above the trees we saw the great amorous unabashed face of the full moon it was an exhibition that made me blush feel that i had no right to be there after all these millions of years she ought to be ashamed of herself i cried luton in a field of that distant half-neglected farm i found an avenue of great elms leading to nothing but i could see where the wheat-bearing earth had been levelled into a terrace and in one corner there were broken overgrown garden gate-posts almost hid among great straggling trees of yew this then was the place i had come to see here had stood the great palladian house or palace with its terraces and gardens and artificial waters this field had once been the favourite resort of eighteenth-century fashion the duchesses and beauties had driven hither in their gilt coaches and the bows and wits of that golden age of english society and although the house had long since vanished and the plough had gone over its pleasant places yet for a moment i seemed to see this fine company under the green and gold of that great avenue seemed to hear their gossiping voices as they passed on into the shadows the danger of going to church as i came away from the evening service walking home from that sabbath adventure some neighbours of mine passed me in their motor laughing were they laughing at me i wondered uneasily and as i sauntered across the fields i vaguely cursed those misbelievers yes yes their eyes should be darkened and their lying lips put to silence they should be smitten with the botch of egypt and a sore botch in the legs that cannot be healed all the teeth should be broken in the mouths of those bloody men and daughters of backsliding their faces should become as flames and their heads be made utterly bald their little ones should be dashed to pieces before their eyes and brimstone scattered upon their habitations they should be led away with their buttocks uncovered they should stagger to and fro as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit but as for the godly man who kept his sabbath his should be the blessings of those who walk in the right way these blessings the words came back to me from the evening lesson these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee and suddenly in the mild summer air it seemed as if like a swarm of bees inadvertently wakened the blessings of the bible were actually rushing after me from the hot remote passionate past of hebrew history out of the oriental climate and unctuous lives of that infuriate people gross good things were coming to overwhelm me with benedictions for which i had not bargained great oxen and camels and concubines were panting close behind me he goats and she goats and rams of the breed of bashan my barn should burst their doors with plenty and all my paths drop fatness my face should be smeared with the oil of rejoicing all my household and the beasts of my household should beget and bear increase and as for the fruit of my own loins it should be for multitude as the sands of the sea and as the stars of heaven my little one should be as olive plants around my table sons and daughters and their sons and daughters to the third and fourth generation should rise up and call me blessed my feet should be dipped in butter and my eyes stand out with fatness i should flourish as the cedar of lebanon that bringeth forth fruit in old age the sonnet 
It came back to me this rainy afternoon for no reason, the memory of another afternoon long ago in the country, when at the end of an autumn day I had stood at the rain-dashed window and gazed out at the dim landscape. And as I watched the yellowing leaves blown about the garden I had seen a flock of birds rise above the half-denuded poplars and wheel in the darkening sky. I had felt there was a mysterious meaning in that moment, and in that flight of dim-seen birds an augury of ill omen for my life. It was a mood of autumnal minor poet melancholy, a mood with which, it had occurred to me, I might fill out the rhymes of a lugubrious sonnet. But my sonnet about those birds, those starlings or whatever they were, will, I fear, never be written now for how can I now recapture the sadness, the self-pity of youth? Alas, what do the compensations of age after all amount to? What joy can the years bring, half so sweet as the unhappiness they take away? Weltanschauung When now and then on a calm night I look up at the stars, I reflect on the wonders of creation, the unimportance of this planet, and the possible existence of other worlds like ours. Sometimes it is the self-poised and passionless shining of those serene orbs which I think of. Sometimes Kant's phrase comes into my mind about the majesty of the starry heavens and the moral law. Or I remember Xenophanes gazing at the broad firmament and crying, All is one! and thus in that sublime exclamation enunciating for the first time the great doctrine of the unity of being but these thoughts are not my thoughts they eddy through my mind like scraps of old paper or withered leaves in the wind what i really feel is the survival of a much more primitive mood a view of the world which dates indeed from before the invention of language it has never been put into literature no poet has sung of it, no historian of human thought has so much as alluded to it. Astronomers in their glazed observatories, with their eyes glued to the ends of telescopes, seem to have had no notion of it. But sometimes, far off at night, I have heard a dog howling it at the moon. THE ALIEN The older I grow, the more of an alien I find myself in the world. I cannot get used to it cannot believe that it is real. I think I must have been made to live on some other star, or perhaps I am subject to hallucinations and hear voices. Perhaps what I seem to see is delusion and doesn't happen. Perhaps people don't really say the things I think I hear them saying. Ah, someone ought to have told me when I was young. I should certainly have been told of the horrible songs that are sung in drawing-rooms. They ought to have warned me about the great fat women who suddenly get up and bellow out incredible recitations. Hypotheses I got up with stoic fortitude of mind in the cold this morning, but afterwards in my hot bath I joined the school of Epicurus. I was a materialist at breakfast, after it an idealist, as I smoked my first cigarette and turned the world to transcendental vapor. But when I began to read the Times I had no doubt of the existence of an external world. So all the morning and all the afternoon opinions kept flowing into and out of the receptacle of my mind till by the time the enormous day was over it had been filled by most of the widely known theories of existence, and then emptied of them. THE ARGUMENT The long speculation of life, this thinking and soliloquizing that always goes on inside me, this running over and over of hypothesis and surmise and supposition, one day this infinite argument will have ended, the debate will be forever over, I shall have come to an indisputable conclusion, and my brain will be at rest. End of More Trivia Part 3 End of Trivia and More Trivia by Logan Pearsall Smith